On today's episode of Kilts and Culture with USA Kilts, we try Irish coffee, we release the Kilts and Culture tartan, and Americans try haggis. <laughs> Hello, boys and girls. Welcome to Kilts and Culture. Mm-hmm. I'm Rocky. This is Eric. Yo. Today, special treat. In honor of Irish Coffee Day, is it? What's the... It was Coffee Day. Coffee like, Day. Oh, Irish Coffee Day specifically. Irish Coffee okay. Day okay. specifically. When it's, is it? Uh, What's January 25th. January 25th. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which is also... also- Robert Burns' birthday. Burns night. So, I don't yes. know. It sounds like somebody was trying to hop on the bandwagon. Should be like, yeah, shouldn't it be like a hot toddy day then as well? Oh. I I could see Irish coffee being very useful after a <clears throat> burn supper because that's a very filling meal. It's very true. So having a bit of a pick-me-up afterwards would be true. not a bad thing. Very good. That being said, coffee. Um, so, <laughs> we have homemade Irish coffee. That's right. Eric's grandpa's recipe. Or one he found online. Um, Grandpa's you recipe. Know where the recipe came from? Sure. Actually, actually, I researched the recipe from two different places, but the main source for me, I don't know if you can see this, but this is a Bible of mine. This is Trader Vic's Bartender's Guide, circa 1947. Revised <coughs> in 1974 to get all those newfangled recipes in there, but um, Irish coffee is one of the recipes in here. Nice. And I, I did a slight variation on it, which I can discuss as we're drinking. Very good. But, uh, and Mac did a little homework on it too, I think. But uh, the uh, yeah, well this is actually, um, Some people will think that Irish coffee is an American drink. It actually is Irish. It actually, is an Irish invention. I so, did not know that. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. The one thing that uh, we talked about earlier that I didn't know either was Irish coffee, traditional Irish coffee, using my finger quotations there, um, doesn't have Baileys. Yep. Um, when they mm-hmm. when Eric brought in the ingredients, he's loading them up, and I'm like, uh, "Where's your Baileys?" And he's like, "Oh, it doesn't have Baileys." And what? Yeah. What do you mean it doesn't have Bailey's? Bailey's is delicious, but it was originally kind of made up as a shortcut for uh, doing this kind of drink fast. Because you don't really need it. You don't really need to measure out uh, all the individual things. There's yeah. basically, you might as well run down the ingredients now. Basically, you sure. have the, you obviously got the whipped cream on here, uh, which is a not highly peaked whipped cream. It's a little you know soft, so it melts into the coffee faster. Uh, then you have the coffee, which is usually Cafe Americano or something else uh, that's a nice, strong coffee. And then you have uh, brown sugar. And you have anywhere between an ounce to two ounces of whiskey of your choice. Jameson is a traditional mm-hmm. bar whiskey for making our coffee. So we yeah. went with the, the bog standard Jameson's. Yeah, we went with, and this is the cask mates, which we just happened to like. We tried it once as a as a try on the show a few months ago and decided we liked it. But yeah, yeah, then very good. There's lots of Irish whiskeys out there, and you get what you pay for to some extent. I'd say this is kind of middle of the road. Yeah. Now I. <clears throat> this is going to be an interesting one for me. I am generally not a fan of hot alcohol, so like hot alcohol drinks. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm curious. It looks delicious. So I really am curious how this is going to go. Well, we'll find out. Bottoms up. Hopefully it won't make you sick. Mac, you yeah. want to come and get yours in Mr. Corvettes? Mac? This will not be piping hot because I did have to make them you know, a bit oh, before the show five started. Five minutes ago. But, yeah. yeah. In fact, if you're really serious, you actually preheat. There you go. Uh, you actually preheat the mugs with hot water. Oh, I think. Uh, you're very welcome. Hmm. Grab yours. Yep. New tart keeps flipping over. Okay. It's interesting. In five minutes. Oh, I guess it's the brown sugar on the bottom. Yeah, there's a bit of separation. Okay. Yeah, and there is some. Some of the sugar did not dissolve. Should we swirl it or? Something? Yeah, if I had a swizzle, I might swizzle it. Swizzle it. This, this again comes from making it. Okay. Quickly before a show. But. And how how does one drink? You're supposed, to sip it, you're supposed to sip it through the cream. It is, so, yes. Yeah. It's drunk through the cream. Mm-hmm. So, let Indeed. the cream be the filter. Let the cream get you creamed. Okay. Or drunk, smelling drunk it. Drunk through your cream. I smell... I'm just going to smell like cream. No, I smell Jameson's. You smell the Jameson? Yep. Yeah. Smell, it smells like sweet mm-hmm. in Jameson's. Yeah, there's a, there's like a teaspoon of brown sugar in here, so it's going to be sweet. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not like an over... There's not a ton of odor to it. It's like not a strong scent mm-hmm. okay it doesn't sl- like smell like coffee like i love coffee mm-hmm. but it doesn't smell strong like coffee probably mm-hmm. it's it's all hidden under the cream yeah okay all right so slancha slancha ma there's the jamesons i'm happy 
I wasn't expecting the cream to be so thick. So when I sucked it in, kind of like shot into my back of my throat. Mm. Yeah, watch that. Yeah. That organic whipped cream will get you every time. We're going to have like mustaches throughout the show now. I was wondering about that, actually. Yeah. I was wondering about it. Let yeah. myself have a cream mustache. I've got another filter. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you built in stirrer, Mac? Yeah. Just the... I'm not, you know, to be honest, I don't think I've ever made Irish coffee at home <laughs> like this. So I've, I've made other coffee drinks. Like I've made more, uh, more <coughs> tiki cocktail type coffee drinks. But um, this is actually relatively simple compared to some of the coffee cocktails I've made. But, but I, I like it. I'm, I'm happy. I'm very happy. Do we do the ratings for this like we do for the for regular drinks? Sure. Okay. He's still confused by it. I think he is. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to, if I'm honest, I'm trying to find something I like about it. It's one of those things where I like all of the elements on their own, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but when you mix it all together... It makes an unholy terror in my mouth. Wow. Wow. Well, Was I that too harsh? It's, yeah, it was a little harsh, dude. The, no, it's I, like the cream. Like the cream looks delicious. Brown sugar, I love. Mm -hmm. Like if I just like tasted the cream, I was like, okay. Then it, 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 the hot alcohol just gets to me. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Some people do have a reaction to warm alcohol. It's true. Now, Kirk really? is, oh. is asking if you did make the uh, whipped cream. Yeah. Yeah, this is a organic whipping cream I get from a local store, and it's flavored with a, a dash of maple syrup and a dash of uh, vanilla. But I have a kitchen-made mixer, so making whipped cream is actually no big deal. Hold on. Just the cream. See, the cream itself is good. Mm -hmm. I like the brown sugar in it. Mm -hmm. And I, I love coffee. I think I needed to make it hotter so that my sugar was sure to dissolve. I will say that that was probably a tactical error on my part. Yeah, and if I pre-warmed the mugs and done that, I think you the, the coffee will be sweeter, the beverage overall will be sweeter. You're going to get a sugar rush at the very end, basically, if you have the guts to finish it. Right. What do you guys think? I I think when you drink it actually through the cream, you get it you get it straight through the cream. It is much better when you when I think I'm getting what you're getting when as the glass is getting lower, or the the fluid is getting lower in there. The cream is, is just kind of falling to the top. So when I tip the glass now, now the cream, the, back. the cream is now moving up and the liquid's coming underneath of it. Mm -hmm. So now I'm getting that strong shot of the Jameson like you were you were right. getting. So I think now that it's this way, I'm getting more how you, you were how you <coughs> are. But when I first start off, I really liked it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Coraline. I really liked the cream. <laughs> it's worth fair disclosure Coraline is not a drinker so she, she she's really she's taking one for the team by drinking anything alcoholic on the show here but. we love abusing our staff it's fun yeah that's why you have a business that's why you have a start exactly. company basically yeah um what did you have, what did you you had some notes I was trying to remember some notes and I couldn't remember all and you had some notes on it right Mac no we gotta yeah. we gotta rate it too one to ten true um sorry we're getting we're getting some stuff in uh <sighs> Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. We got one uh, said maybe we should have uh, should have shook it, should have shook it, and show be poured on a spoon and not yes. not uh, you are correct. In. You're correct. There is a there is a uh, there's a technique where you pour it on a spoon or pour it over a spoon to do that. And I also didn't do that. Um, I have horrible luck every time I've ever tried to do that. You, sir. Yeah, yeah. Like trying to do layers in a cocktail, like yeah. drizzling something over a spoon. Oh, well, Guinness, that. you're supposed to pour over a spoon, too. So. True, true. So, <clears throat> hey, guys, this is my first attempt. Cut me some slack. Um, I think it's a gallon attempt. Mac, we didn't go over scores. Oh, scores. One to ten. Um, going through the cream, definitely I will give that a, I'll give that an, uh, an 8.5. The, uh, if when the cream's not there, then I'm going to, I'll lower that to more of like a 5.3. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. All about, dairy, all about the dairy products. Mm -hmm. um, this is to say nothing of Eric's ability as a bartender. <laughs> like a one. <laughs> <laughs> but the cream, like a nine. Great. 
I have, I have lots of leftover whipped cream you can yeah, take some home. I'll have that. Back here with a spoon just <laughs> eating it. <laughs> oh, yeah, we do at home. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like a little pie and a lot of whipped cream. Um, I'm going to give it... I'm going to give it a seven and a half because I know I can do better. Okay. I'm, I'm very happy with it, but I know I can mix this a little bit better with a little practice, so... I do think a, a lot of the recipes just call for straight sugar and this recipe call for brown sugar, and I think that does make a difference. Just so you... Just, if you're going to try at home, I do recommend using the brown sugar. Okay, I'll I'll do it this way. <laughs> the cream itself, say about an eight. The brown sugar, like brown sugar, especially with the cream, mm-hmm. eight and a half. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Jameson's six and a half. I'll relieve you of this then. Coffee. Americano or regular, like the, the coffee itself, because um, I smelled it when you were actually making it. Mm-hmm. I didn't taste it, but I'm gonna I'm gonna approximate. It's good coffee. Good I coffee. would say eight and a half, nine, mm-hmm. somewhere in there. Okay. Um, everything together, one point eight. Like I wow. I wouldn't. <laughs> It's it's not my bag. I wouldn't. That's cool. That's cool. You're I awesome. wouldn't do it. And again, it's. I'm saying it's. It doesn't matter whether it's yours or it's anyone else's. I'd I probably understand. give it about the same. I understand. It's yeah. just like it's it's not your kind of food. So yeah. Okay. Indeed. Okay. Very good. So at least I got points for using good ingredients, guys. Indeed. Yes. Yep. Cool. Happy right. Irish Coffee Day in advance. <clears throat> And I also highly recommend making some of this up for St. Patrick's Day. It is, it is both a, an old world and a new world tradition. It'll like keep a, you warm and yeah. keep you warm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so did you have, you had some notes on the origin? Yeah, so we're getting a, a few different things here. Um, I was actually just kind of looking up more on, uh, on, on Bailey's as far as when that kind of became more of a, a prevalent thing. Uh-huh. Uh, or more is what people know today as and we're not really finding the exact date when that kind of kicked in, but it looks like there's several different variations um, that can be used. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also talking about using rum <coughs> in instead of whiskey, okay. more of a, a Caribbean <coughs> flavor to it. That's where, you, that's where you get into the, the, the tiki, the tiki styles, which uh, yeah. coffee grog. Cool. So it looks like it's uh, what mid nineteenth century is when it, it first comes around, and it's, it's you see similar type things, not the ex- not this exact thing, but similar type things in Germany, Denmark, and um, so it looks like France too. Yeah, France is the next one that just kind of popped up here, but uh, yeah, it looks like it doesn't make reference. The first time it's referenced as Irish. It is not until World War II. Mm-hmm. Yep. A story I had heard was that uh, this barkeep who was working at a bar that was adjoining an airport in County Limerick made it for some passengers and pilots of a flight that had been grounded by weather or delayed by severe weather, and they were miserable and they were cold and tired, and he whipped this up to uh, to try and give them a pick-me-up. Nice. There's, there's another story, I think, of, a, of some Irish officer made it for his <coughs> men during the war, but... Yeah, that was the airport is in County Limerick. Right. Um, so I guess we can thank County Limerick for this. There you go. Yeah. <clears throat> mm. Well, I was happy. Yeah. I enjoyed it. I'm determined we do more Irish tries on the show. No. Yeah. Going forward. I'm yeah. I'm fine with trying Irish stuff, just not yeah. hot liquor. <laughs> well, it's funny yeah. you say that. You're thinking about things that you like individually, but mixing them might not be a good idea. Right. Um, we didn't know how long this try was going to take. We thought we might want to pad it out with another thing to try. Okay. So, uh, here, let, me, uh, let me give you a clue here. So, here's exhibit A. Okay. 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 And, uh, oh, yeah, okay. Um, here we go. Here's uh, exhibit B. Okay. Okay. I, lo- I think I like this you so know far. Where we're going? This, this should look familiar to you. Okay, my other this coffee is your, mug. Your other coffee mug. And, Are we making uh, a different version of Irish coffee? You know what? I'm I'm missing one ingredient. What was what's the last thing I should put in here, Mac? Cream. 
Sorry, I'm finishing up this one. Okay. Um, uh, I know. How about some breath mints? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. We're going to put your taste buds where your mouth is. <laughs> so, uh, so this is the breath mint challenge? This is the breath mint challenge. I cannot okay. stand. Every every month, I'm like, ah, ah, with Rocky having his coffee and his Lagavulin and his uh, breath mints. So we joked about what would happen if you combined them. Now we're going to find out. Okay. Do we have any... The only thing we're missing is creamer. Do we oh, have any coffee creamer? creamer? Yeah, yeah, we got creamer. Um, <laughs> I happen to have some is. right here. Okay. Only the finest. Wild Bach coffee creamer. Yeah, I, I was going to use <laughs> some right. of the whipped cream, but I didn't think this experiment warranted. How many of us are trying this? I guess I kind of have to. Okay. Mac, do you want to try this? Yeah, hard I'm no. down for it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Coffee? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know how to use one of these, right? Yes. Okay. I'm aware. Okay. All right. This could. This is the creation of an all-new cocktail, guys. Is, talk about unholy. It's going to go down in... Uh, I can't believe I'm doing this to Lagavulin. I can't it's, believe you're doing it to Lagavulin, too, but if it, it's all for the si- sake of science. All right. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit uh, ole, but okay, okay. that's fine. All right. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I got some mugs. All right, good, good, good. All right. Mac, I'll give you the German one. Oh, wait, no, this is yours. Yeah, I'll give you this one. Okay. Good God. I'm sorry. Pretty well. Is that enough? I don't know. I, I have good a God. I have a, <laughs> I have a jigger over oh, here. If you you right, could have measured it if you wanted to. No, no. This. This is not a precise recipe. Yeah, not yet. All right, how many breath mints do we put in? All of them. I don't know. <laughs> Why did Rocky break into Jimmy oh, Glick? Oh, I was just joking. Uh, oh, I'm not. We're going to do this. Oh, Let's do go. this. Okay. All right. There's probably about 30 breath mints. All right. Oh, good God. Now, oh, this is delicious. I can tell it already. All right. Is Icebreakers Wintergreen? No, these are... Uh, ice, to be specific? Icebreakers mint, spearmint flavor. Spearmint. A- absolutely. Spearmint. 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 My grandma used to Kitty. choose spearmint gum all the time, and I'm. she always used to give us gum when we were little, so spearmint's my gum flavor. I see. So, spearmint. Just, just like grandma used to yeah. lock up. <laughs> this is my old thing. They're really in there, dude. Keep going. They're not dissolving yet. I don't know how much they're going to dissolve. They're, your coffee is not hot enough. Okay, okay, that's better, that's better, that's better. <laughs> this is <laughs> this is an abomination. I wonder if you're going to be able... Oh, I can smell the mint. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. Mac, are you ready? Oh, jeez. No, no. Finishing this, you know that, right? No, you are. I ain't. Nah. Let's get it. <sighs> Mac, you want to come get your mug? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm not sure you do. <laughs> the little bits are making noise around the bottom. Oh, holy Christ, preserve us. <laughs> oh, my God. This is going to be so horrible. <laughs> there. You're over there, bud. No. Over there, now. Here you go. Here you go. Sorry. All right. Nice knowing you. Well, I'm kill. We promise we'll get to the real content oh. momentarily. Oh. Talk about a, like a food challenge. It's frothy. <laughs> it's whew. It smells like yeah. hairspray. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I was trying to think. It smells very chemical, like detergent or something. Oh, like floor wax or something. It's <laughs> shimmer. We've reinvented shimmer. Yeah, look, Coraline. You at least have to smell it. She, she did. did. Oh, that's. This is foul. It's we should run buckets in. <laughs> if the spearmint factory burned down, <laughs> and back to Jimmy Glick. Uh. <laughs> it smells like that one aisle in the hardware store. You go down the you go down the aisle with the 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 the, the you know the oils. I was going to say at the farmers market or something, because the the spearmint's uh, strong like, now. There's like a chemical linoleumy kind of. Plastic off-gassing kind of... I can't even describe this. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It reminds me of hardware stores I've walked in. You're like gun oil. 
Like you went to the hardware store and they got the gun oil in the back with the, you know, uh, holy sh sugar. You had. If, if you're at all curious what this actually smells like, you have to make this at home. This, this is a very, very original scent. Mac, ready? Into the Valley of Death. Road to the, my heart. Big gulp. Come on, watch. It doesn't taste as bad as it smells. I think it tastes worse. I think it tastes exactly like it smells. <laughs> I'm trying to... I'm trying to... Wine I wine. can hear it bubbling as I'm, <laughs> as I'm like, tipping the glass back. <laughs> oh. You deserve this. That's all I can say. Where's Adam? We need to save the rest of it for Adam. <sighs> oh. If it weren't spearmint, if it were wintergreen or something... No, no not maybe not. Then. It would just taste like Ben Gay. It's you're right. It does it kind of smells like it tastes like it tastes like uh, menthol? Is, is there menthol in those things? It's spearmint, natural and artificial flavor. It's, yeah, it, it's a it new flavor. It tastes yeah, it tastes like I'm drinking Ben Gay uh, or Tiger Bomb or something. Uh, it's 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 drinkable Tiger Bomb. I think, I think Coraline needs some smelling salts over here. Here, just smell this. It'll wake <laughs> you up. Sorry, I promise. <laughs> uh, yeah, All right. okay. All right, I think we're done. That's. You have to rate it. Oh. Yeah, oh, she's oh. right. Oh, the scale doesn't go negative. It's. <laughs> oh, all right, Mac. If this was the last thing I had to drink, <laughs> if I was stranded on an island and this is the last thing I would have to drink, I'm going for the seawater. You're going for the deadly dehydration yeah. water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, wow. Lots of zeros, point, lots of zeros, one. Mm -hmm. I'll give mm -hmm. it the okay. one okay. at the very end. All right. Okay. Give it a point zero 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 one for being liquid. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. It, it it blended well. It did. Yeah, it blended well. There's a frothy great. note to it. It's It has a, a strong odor. I Are these all sick. positives? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. All right. I can't do this anymore. All right. I'm going to get sick. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to rate it pie because I think if I drank enough of this, I'd be able to see through time. Hmm. I'll give it a two. <laughs> oh. Oh. It's, yeah. He rated it more than the Irish coffee. <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> 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 I need to hit an actual just bottle at this chug point. Chug the bottle. Damn. Yes. Oh, my goodness gracious. Oh, just Okay. I'm sure we have quite a few people in the room, so to say, oh, now. I'm sorry to everyone. It's... In case you're wondering, that's why we do these things at the beginning, is to kind of warm up and also give a chance for people to filter in. You know, if they're just finding the channel, you know, and tuning in sort of on time. So I think I we accomplished I that. I think I hope. I hope I haven't ruined log of warm for myself. Oh my god. I, I was starting to feel my stomach turn. <laughs> oh, so am I. Really was. Oh. Carl's comment, oh my god. All that mint. Yeah. There was, there was that less. Was, that yeah, was painful. Perhaps if we had less mint. Yeah, maybe. Like zero. We need to tweak the recipe. Oh. Nah. I wouldn't even put log of warm in coffee, though. Not a pe don't put a peaty scotch in. You thought they handed anything. it to me. I just wanted to torture you. I didn't. Think I didn't think it through fully. Should have thought you about forgot that. you were on the other end of the yeah, torture as well. Yeah, yes, the yes, whole indeed. team spirit thing. Right. Uh, My esophagus this, is minty fresh. It has tastes different now. All right, Mac. Delivers. I'd love to answer some questions to get my mind off of this. So uh, okay, all right. So we have well, Jeff. before oh, before okay. we start, boys and girls, two things. Oh, yeah, a couple of announcements. Three things. One. Sorry for all that. It was horrible. Two. Around halfway through the show, we're going to unveil the Kilts and Culture Tartan. Mm -hmm. uh, we designed a tartan for the Kilts and Culture Face Group book group, which kind of grew out of this show as a way to, you know, basically create a community and have uh, uh, people talk back and forth and just, you know, kind of hang out and talk about kilts and tartan and stuff. 
Um, so there was a bit of a uh, a bit of a coup within the group. But they decided they wanted a tartan and had to have a tartan. So you will see the tartan unleashed, unveiled, behold, whatever other big words. Yep. Um, about halfway through the show. Then at the end of the show, we did a video segment where we wanted all of the staff here to try haggis. Not everyone here has had haggis before. I'd, I'd venture to say most of them haven't. Um, so we wanted to see if they were going to like it or loathe it or both. Um, so we're going to do that at the end of the show. We have a nice little uh, funny little clip. Yeah. Um, so stick around for all that stuff. Mm-hmm. That being said, Mr. Mac, question number one of the day. All right. Well, this is more, this is time sensitive here. So fair enough. Okay. So we've got uh, Josh. He's about <clears throat> uh, about to get married tomorrow. And he's using Good his planning. wedding package. Um, he ordered from us and he would like to know, is there any last minute tips on rocking that outfit to the max? Um, we have uh, some videos on how to get dressed in a kilt outfit. I'd say watch the videos. If you've never really worn a kilt before, watch the video. Make sure you're you know, putting all the parts of the outfit together properly for the big day. Um, second part, especially if you're wearing a fly plate, have your best man know what it's supposed to look like and have him kind of sort you out for the photos. Make sure in all your photos, if you're wearing a fly plate, it's pulled down and you're not disheveled looking. Um, you want to make sure that you're really perfecting the outfit so that it's, you know, you're going to have those pictures for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. Um, any other only um, thoughts? Basically, yeah, go over the go over the details a few days in advance so you, you know, you know what you're doing. So today. Try, try the, yeah, I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> Um, you might want to try things on a little bit tonight. Uh, for instance, put the kilt pin on the kilt, you know, so you make sure the placement is exactly where you want it. Uh, there are little things like that you can do. Uh, adjust the elastic on the garters for your flashes. You can do that ahead of time. The less you have to worry about tomorrow when you're about to enter the heat of action, uh, the better. Uh, that being said, I would say also allow a little extra time than you think you need so that if something goes wrong or if you feel uncomfortable or something, you know, you know, gets wrinkled or something and you didn't expect it, you have time to fix it. Yeah. Um, you want to, uh, Bo Brummel said, never rush the hour of the toilet. It's basically saying, you know, always take your time dressing in the morning. So that'd be my advice is basically give yourself enough time. Fair. Yes. Um, <laughs> I don't even know what to say about the toilet thing. Um, it's old use of the <clears throat> word. It's not what you're thinking. I, I know, but we're in now. Um, the only other thing I would say is just, you know, rock it like you own it. Um, yeah. you know, that's Confidence true. goes a long way. Yeah, did he mention if he'd worn the kilt before? Uh, didn't say in in okay. the in the comment. No. Yeah, if you've never worn a kilt before at all, I highly recommend. I think this is where you're going. <clears throat> Try put put just the kilt on tonight and walk around a little bit. Get used to how it moves, how it feels on you, how it shifts in the course of wearing it. In case uh, you want to decide that you want the straps tighter tomorrow than you think you want them now. Uh, if you've worn a kilt before and you know what you're doing in that regard, then you don't need to worry about that. But if you've never worn a kilt before, then absolutely give you a chance, give yourself a chance to wear it in a non-pressure situation to get used to it. I agree. Yeah. Let's say and pers- congratulations. Yeah, and some uh, personal experience. Make sure you have everything together. Oh at least, yeah, yeah, yeah. At Make least, sure all like, the pieces keep parts. every all the all the bits and bobs together. <laughs> well, what happened to you? Uh, we forgot something. I okay. remember we had. The sporn chain or something, something goofy that we had to go back for. Uh, um, so I sent two people back while the rest of us got ready. But yeah, <clears throat> always make sure you have all everything there ready to go. If you have groomsmen, if the groomsmen are wearing kilts, make sure they've tried on their outfits. Yeah. My brother swore up and down on a stack of Bibles that his kilt was fine, that it was going to be fine, even though he'd never worn a kilt before. <laughs> so... The morning of our wedding, of my wedding to my wife, not my wedding to my brother, that would just be weird. Um, the morning of my wedding, uh, my brother went to put on his, no, check that. The morning of my wedding, didn't feel like putting on his kilt yet because we're going to go down to breakfast and oh, stuff. Geez. And I was just like, no, try on the damn kilt. I want to see you in it. And he put it on and it was too small. Oh, I guess I gained a few pounds. Oh. So the morning of my wedding, which coincidentally, also, the same day as the Phoenixville Celtic Festival, I had to drive my brother through the crowds through Phoenixville, 25 minutes from the wedding mm. location, mm-hmm. to go to the shop to open it up, even though the store was closed, 
to move the buckles on his kilt to get out and drive back to the wedding. Wow. Yes. Wow. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Um, now, it, it all worked out fine, but the moral of the story is try the stuff on ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Make sure the groomsmen, if they're wearing kilts, are trying things on ahead of time. Make sure everything yeah. is sorted. It's one less thing to have to worry about. Yeah, and they may not be your best man, but have somebody who's your point man. Just like, you know, a bride will have a, a bridesmaid who is in charge of stuff. Basically, somebody who can keep your <clears throat> brain together as you're feeling frazzled and who can watch out for these things for you. And if there's an emergency, they can run and get the missing part or they can find the safety pins or, you know, whatever. You know, have have a, have a somebody who's your wingman yeah. to help you out. And always bring a sewing kit. A little needle and thread. A little travel sewing kit. Yeah, a little yeah. travel sewing kit. Yeah, especially for stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Indeed. Enjoy. Congratulations again. Yes, congratulations. Mr. Mack. All right, so we have Chuck <coughs> saying he's an avid snowboarder. He's cool. asking if we've ever seen anyone ski or board in a kilt. Yes, we have. Mm-hmm. The, uh, it's, did I do it? No, I don't so think I ever. used to sn- snowboard. But yeah, I used was... to snowboard. I don't think, I don't think I ever snowboarded in the kilt. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> I've seen it done a few ways. I've seen guys snowboard in a kilt with long johns on underneath and then the kilt on top. I've seen them put the kilt on top of like snow pants and I've seen them wear just the kilt and, you know, socks and flashes. Um, so I've seen it a few different ways. It really boils down to how good are you at snowboarding yeah. and how often is your rear going to be touching the snow? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'd say if there's a sport out there, somebody at some point has tried to do it in a kilt. Yeah. So yeah, have fun. <laughs> I always wanted to, I, I threatened my uh, my deck hockey team, like basically street hockey inside. I threatened my deck hockey team when USA Kilts sponsored them to that we were going to be, you know, we had USA Kilts jerseys and I was going to make kilts for all the guys. Yeah, man. And at least for the goalie to help protect the five hole so we would not get scored on as much because he <laughs> kind of sucked. Oh, ouch. Ouch. But that no, been awesome. never did it. Oh, well. Yeah. Hmm. But yeah. If you do it, and kilts are fun. get some pictures or video. I'd love to see it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Because you say you've seen people do it. I've never seen people yeah, do it. Yeah. I, mean, I, I have a picture of a guy, but they're like at the bottom of the slopes with his buddy. I have a guy in a right. kilt after skiing, but uh, <clears throat> I don't have any action shots of somebody doing it. I've seen, yeah, I've seen the one you have, I think, is, is he a skier or a snowboarder? I can't tell. Um, I can't remember. And we used to have a customer, <sighs> I completely forget his name because it was like 14, 15 years ago now. John. Um, yeah, John. Yeah. I remember John. He's a great guy. Uh, no, Chuck. Big, tall Chuck, big guy. Okay. Um, he used to go skiing. Now, now, actually, no, his name is Chuck. I'm not lying. Um, no, Chuck used to go skiing in his uh, in his kilt. So I have pictures somewhere of a big, tall dude in a kilt Yeah, I'd like skiing. to see those. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. And he wore his flashes on the outside of his snow boots, of his ski nice. boots. It was pretty awesome. Nice. That's awesome. So. Yeah, the, the funkiest sport picture I have in the archive is our, our friend uh, Captain Ron, who's a uh, scuba dive instructor. And we actually made a kilt just for scuba diving for him, you know, with, with the web straps and everything. Uh, so you could use it kind of partially to promote his business. But he actually, we have a picture of him, you know, in the, the bright blue Caribbean ocean with his uh, with his kilt on. So I never want to make another kilt with straps and webbing straps. Was, did you make it or did I make it? I think it was a combination of, uh, I think Ian... I, think Ian, I remember it took like a long time to figure out how the hell we were going to do it. I think Ian did made it, and we, it was uh, like a little bit of us, and like me and you and him together, just trying to how many needles working did on the um, on the webbing. Needles were fine. Yeah, it okay. was just the uh, it was just trying to figure out how the buckles were all going to work together, oh, okay. okay, in in how they were going to have to lay and hook and then be mm-hmm. able to expand. Yeah, because it's it was kind of like backwards because you're you're pulling on the buckle strap yeah it was weird huh. yeah don't want to do it again anyway yeah. next question well chuck did say he's he is a climber and if he could figure <clears> out <throat> the harness uh he would be able to he would he would wear it for that but uh could you wear the yeah. kilt put on the harness first and then put on the kilt i think that'd be weird well I you, want you know it's even more weird just yeah. trying to put a harness on but you know grabbing your bulge when it's you know you have a kilt on and it all the stuff goes around the kilt you need the yeah. separation because it goes between your legs. Yeah, it's just I don't know for what length of time you have the harness on when you're doing a climb. I'd have to ask my brother-in-law. He's the a rock whole, climber. But... The whole time. Yeah, but I mean, like, is he gonna be kilting like when they're when they're hiking in to the to the to the rock or whatever? And then is he taking the harness off when they get to the top? Or I don't know. 
I don't know. I yeah. don't know anything about it. Some things but. are not necessarily suited directly for kilting. Yeah. Um, so if you're going to do it, if it were me, I'd probably put the harness on and then put the kill on top. Hmm. Yeah, I think that yeah. makes the most sense. Yeah. Okay. Indeed. Good photo op, though. Depending on the angle. <laughs> Next question. <clears throat> so we have uh, we have Matthew uh, saying, when going with a PC, are diced hose the most appropriate choice? Sure. They're extremely um, appropriate. It's a question of whether you want to invest in them or not for your particular look. Are they the most appropriate? Um, I'm just taking it the way that he wrote the question. Yeah, it's appropriate is an interesting yeah. word to parse out. They are appropriate with a PC. Yes, yeah. 100%. <clears throat> um, dice toes are definitely appropriate with PC. Argyle hose are absolutely appropriate with a PC. Yeah. Regular colored hose are appropriate with a PC. Um, so there's no more or less appropriate it's just kind of how you want your outfit to look yeah i think it's about the tone um diced and argyle hose are as you probably already know this are some of the oldest uh hose designs there are um so if you want an extremely traditional look like you know really timeless or maybe a bit retro back to turn of the century or even prior you know victorian age then yeah you that's a great way to nail it um a, uh, a solid color pair of hose is much more common these days, and so you could argue it's a little bit more of a contemporary kind of a look. Uh, but it's yeah, if you have them, absolutely flaunt them. I mean, they're they're awesome. You know, not as many people wear them these days simply because of um, I think cost probably. Would you say or availability? Yeah, I mean, and they're it takes a certain personality to pull them off to a degree because um, they're they're yeah. very. It's you're mixing patterns. A okay. lot of guys, Some guys are not do not want that. to mix patterns. Okay. So okay. they'll want to wear a tartan kilt and then solid shirt, solid tie, solid hose. Just feels safer. Yes, it okay. feels safer. There's okay. less of a, a, a chance for a mistake. Also, the people that are matchy-matchy, like, would not necessarily want to wear a black watch tartan kilt with red and black diced mm-hmm. hose. Mm-hmm. It's very traditional. Extremely, it's fine. Extremely traditional, but yeah. But it still doesn't match. And I'm talking about, like, the American matchy-matchy. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so, you. it's yeah, it's it's absolutely appropriate. Is it for everyone? No, mm-hmm. that's kind of where I land on it. Yeah, but it's 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 very it's very definitely uh, it, it it smacks of you really know what you're doing. Yeah, and you, and you are really you know up to your eyeballs in the tradition and being knowledgeable about the tradition. So yeah, <clears throat> along those lines, I'd say it's a great idea. Yes, mixing <clears throat> mixing patterns. Such as, you know, diced hose or argyle hose with the kilt. Um, although the argyle really aren't mixing. They're just the different colored version of the, of the kilt. Yeah. Um, typically. Um, mixing patterns, when done well, I agree 100%, makes you, really lets you stand out, lets you explore a little bit more or, or project more personality. Um, it can look extremely sharp if done well. It can, And it can also look a dog's dinner if done poorly. Yeah. So you have to kind of know what you're doing a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But um, I'll take it to the, you know, on a little bit of an angle to, you know, pattern tweeds with yeah. kilts yeah. or yeah. Uh, like country, you know, check kind of shirts or, you yeah, know, window those kind pane, of things. window pane. Yeah, yeah. Tweeds um, and stuff like that. Yeah. What the heck's the, the official word for the shirt? Mac, what's the word for the shirt? Tattersall. Tattersall. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Tattersall shirts, you know, window pane checks, those kind of things can look great with the kilt but it takes a bold kind of personality to pull it off because it's not an exact match and you're doing something different and you're mixing patterns but if you know what you're doing it can look really really or sharp. at least or at least experience yeah you know, a, once you when you're comfortable with uh the tones and the colors and the tartan and you know in your mind easily what looks right with it then you know it's like oh when you see that shirt randomly in the in the store it's like, hmm, will that look good? That'll match my, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Which I'm assuming that's what you do. I mean, you don't always know you're going to find a shirt that matches X tartan. It's just, it's no, like, it's, aha. You know? <clears throat> yeah, I actually, I will shop for a Tattersall shirt based on my knowledge of what I have in my closet and say, okay, this shirt could work with this or this. You know, this right. one just, it's just a window pane, like a red window pane on a white shirt. Okay, that can match anything with a red stripe in it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it'll, yeah, I, I like I like mixing patterns in that way, um, and I, I think I do a reasonable job of it. I don't think I'm necessarily oh, yeah, yeah, you're the great. best, but I think I do yeah. a pretty good job. At the risk of sounding like a suck-up, I think you do a great job. Thank you. Um, I will give one corollary to the uh, uh, Dyson Argyle's hose thing. If you're doing them, I do not recommend personally 
using uh, tartan flashes. I think that's a little bit much. I would and and his smacks of being not as traditional. You're, uh, Max nodding like he agrees too. Um, I would say stick with the solid color flashes or um, or uh, garter ties if you're going to do that. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Agreed. Yeah, and Matt also did say he's he's seen pictures of uh, uh, Prince Charles wearing diced hose sure. in formal in oh, formal yeah. situations. Yeah. And then uh, he also mentioned about him usually wearing buckle brogues. And then uh, again, not for also our, our also I asked why buckle brogues. Why why does Rocky hate buckle brogues? Uh, <laughs> because well, he was terrified <clears throat> by them at a young age. Yes, I was beaten he, with the buckle brogues. Yeah, he was scared by a Buster Brown commercial. Yeah, the, it, I just. I can't do it. I don't know why. I just hate them. The and I will say it is kind of uh, taken to a new level because I haven't seen any good ones. All the buckle brogues that I have seen have basically the the top little strappy thing. Fake. Well, a they look like like shoes like a little girl would wear to to Catholic school. It it just weirds me out. I just can't get behind okay. it. Um, but the top strap works, and then the bottom, the big old honk and buckle. It's just for the ones that I have seen are just decoration. They're literally like barely sewn on there. They're kind of floppy and hanging off. They're, it just it it's crap. I hate it. Yeah. Ban buckle brogues. Shh. Hashtag ban buckle brogues. You can see Irish coffee talk in there. No. Okay. Um, I think we trod upon the rest of the question or comment. Did, was he saying something else, Mac? You were trying to? No, he was just brought about the Prince Charles wearing dice toes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you want, if you want to do something fun, see if you can find pictures of Prince Charles from like the seventies. It's, uh, the, the slight differences in the fashion between now and then it's kind of amusing to see. They're hard to find, but, uh, you can, you can see some of the variances and his look now is a lot more toned down, I think, than it was back then. But Elvis meets Scottish tradition. Yeah. More, more like, uh, uh Rhinestone you know, Prince Charlie. Yeah. Rhinestone yeah. Prince Charlie. God. No. See more John Travolta in a kilt <laughs> in a disco. Uh, no, please stop. Boogie woogie. <laughs> Mr. Mac. Alrighty, so we have... The duck um, hasn't moved even once. Do you, do you remember you got the duck? <clears throat> yeah, I remember the duck's out okay, there. Okay, the duck is out. Okay. Um, so, uh, speaking of uh, killed hose, we'll stay, we'll stay in, in that area for right now. Uh, we have Lewis saying, when getting hilt, killed hose, he gets ones that fit his feet, but they seem seem not to be high enough on the legs. If he mm. gets ones that are high enough on, on the heel comes up. Yeah. So he's getting, he's getting the opposite. Is there anything to, he's got long that? legs and short feet. Yeah. I've um, had the same problem. Piper hose, get a pair of, uh, Piper killed hose or a pair of our, not to do a plug, but a pair of our cotton hose. You actually fold the top down twice. They're a little bit longer in the leg. So a pair of medium Piper hose, there's a lot more adjustability on how high you want or how low you want the, the turnovers to be. That's also great advice for really, really tall guys. Kurt Kinnaman looking at you. Um, or, yeah, or guys with a little bit wider calves and, and, and smaller feet. Yeah, I'd say the, I'm, I'm always frustrated by having the, uh, the heel cup on, on my kill hose or socks in general riding up towards my ankle when I pull the, pull my uh, hose up properly. And uh, <clears throat> I just kind of deal with it. Occasionally I put on uh, uh, like athletic socks underneath the hose so there's more friction so that the, 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 the heel of the kill hose doesn't ride up as easily. Um, but, you know, sometimes I put on a pair of brogues and I have this little floppily dop of the excess fabric from the, the heel of the kill hose riding up. So I've never really done the Piper hose as a solution, though. That's a good idea. I should do that. Oh, yeah. How about that? And okay. just by the by, floppily dop. Doppily doppily. <clears throat> New word. And I stole from Black Adder, actually. But, ah. Yeah, stole it from a, a Britcom. Fair. I do like floppily dop. That was pretty nice. Okay. okay. You're not, welcome. It's different different vein than gridular, but still good. Yeah, it's not as technical as gridular. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Floppily Any other dop. questions? So we've got KJ4RMZ. Okay. Who's watching us on YouTube? Is that the traditional spelling? I believe so. Okay. Yeah. Just checking. Um, are sneakers okay to wear with a utility style kilt? And what socks? Yes. And, and socks. Yes. Yep. Um, for utility kilts, you're, <clears throat> there are no traditions. Utility kilts only go back to 1999. So it's not like it's steeped in history and this, you know, deep Celtic meaning. Um, 
it is was invented by a dude in Seattle who wanted to put guys in skirts and said, hey, I want to, you know, cut my shorts up the middle, sew it together, cargo pockets. It's fun. Add some pleats. Got a utility kill. Hi, Steve. Um, yeah, by the hi, way. Steve. <laughs> and there's we nothing wrong with that. Steve's a great guy. Yeah. Um, I'm mocking, but Steve Diego from uh, Utility Kills is a great guy. Um, anyway, it's there is no tradition to it. So <clears throat> you can wear kilt hose with it and a pair of, you know, not wingtips necessarily, but, you know, kilt hose with it and a pair of combat boots. You can wear, you know, Converse not, uh, chucks with it and a pair of crew socks. Yeah. Um, you can wear a T-shirt. You can, you know, you can dress it up or down. You can play with it as you want to play with it because there is no tradition. As we move forward in time, you know, the utility kilts have been around for 21 years now. <clears throat> so as we move forward in time, just by the nature of moving forward in time and people experimenting and doing things, traditions will evolve out of this. And there, in 50 years, if utility kilts aren't just a fad and go away entirely, which they may, um, but if they stick around, it will have its own tradition. It's a, you know, a subset of a Good. subset. Yeah. So at that point, there will be some rules and regulate, not rules, but, you know, conventions and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, I could see it evolving into that. It's not there yet. We are making it now. Yeah, I would say um, I'll, I'll temper that a tiny bit by saying that uh, you could you could argue that the same rule we have for regular kilts applies here, too, <clears throat> that you don't want uh, the shoes to distract from the rest of the outfit. I mean, if, if the kilt is the part of the outfit that you're proud of the most and what makes the outfit cool to you, then don't wear like crazy jam, you know, Nike sneakers with all kinds of colors are going to look distracting from the kilt. Um, I think there's definitely become a culture of guys defaulting to uh, combat boots or work boots of some kind with utility kilts. That's the most standard footwear I've ever worn with them. And I think most guys have ever worn with them. Um, sneakers, they, they look more <coughs> relaxed. And I think most guys have a perception of utility kilts as being more of a rough and ready kind of adventure kind of a thing. So the boots feel more appropriate. Um, but you can wear whatever you damn well please. There's really no no problem with any of it. Yeah, I don't think flip flops look very good with a utility kilt or a regular kilt or any kilt or most things aside from sponge trunks. Crocs. Crocs only if they're uh, day glow orange. Yeah. Well, if you're going boating, you see this thing form follows function, especially with utility kilts. If you're wearing your utility kilt out in a boat, you're going fishing. Wear the flip flops, wear the Crocs, whatever. I'll if you're say going this. out on a date, I'd go with a pair of docks or something that looks cool. I'll say this minor callback. Yeah. If it's a black tie affair <laughs> and my options oh, yeah. are Crocs or Buckle mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm going Crocs. Really? Wow. I, okay. I hate Buckle Brogues that much. Okay. Really all right. Okay. Brogues. Okay. Gear down. It's all right. Take, take your Valium. It's all right. Um, I think I figured out my question of the day. <laughs> okay. Cool. <clears throat> uh, yes. More questions? Mac? Sure. Or should I do one? Mac. Or? All right, so we have um, this is actually a pretty good one. Uh, we've got Scott asking. All the other ones are horrible. No, this, this one's not too bad. This, We're not one, judging. This is one of those questions that comes up that does come up uh, quite a bit, and, and some people do get turned off by purchasing a certain tartan because it may not be a family tartan. They have to strictly get this, so it's it's definitely very fitting. Okay. Um. So Scott, he bought a great Scott tartan. Oh, okay. Um. I know it. But it's not his family tartan. What's the best answer to give if someone asks, is that your family's tartan? When I tell him it's not, and I bought it because I like, I like the tartan, and he gets funny looks. Yeah, because you're running up against the <clears throat> preconceived notions that non-kilt wearing people have about it. And it's like, you are wearing kilt. You must have clan. You must be Scottish. Yeah, you're not fitting into their box, and so <clears throat> they get confused. Yeah. Um, you can break people that way. Yeah, um, I have. The, I love doing it. <laughs> the, um, I would say this, if you actually have a family tartan and it's just not that one, like let's say you're a steward, um, but you happen to be wearing the, the great Scott tartan that day, then if you really want to let them off the hook mentally, um, then you just say, oh, hey, is that your family tartan? Nope. My family tartan is Stuart. That one's at home in my closet. This is a universal tartan called great Scott. I just really like this one. This is my second kilt. Right. Period. Um, the if it if you don't have a family tartan, then if you want to give the 
I don't want to say politically correct, but the answer that would let them off the hook again mentally, um, you could say, nope. I don't have a family tartan, but I really, really love kilts, so I chose a universal one. This one is called the Great Scott Tartan. It's a universal one that anyone can wear. Um, again, you're you're placating their their preconceived notions of oh, it you know you must have clan tartan to wear kilt. So you're giving them what they actually want to hear. You're making not letting them think ill of you because they're going to think ill of you because they're idiots because um, they don't know what the hell they're doing. Um, but that being said, it's a way to give them the answer that is accurate and gives them the information that they I think they want. Yeah. I'd say either of your answers would let them off the hook. Yeah. But, uh, it's up to you. It's, uh, it, it's not your responsibility to educate people or to divulge your personal reasons for anything in this world, frankly. Um, <clears throat> but it, you have to gauge on each situation, how much you feel like educating that person versus how much you just want to get out of the conversation. Cause you're trying to get through the line at the, at the, you know, the quickie mark. Now, so, now, Eric, we do we do tell people to be good mentors. We do, we do, but I don't want I don't want people to have to feel like they have to stop and give a lecture to every single person they meet on the street. I think I think I think you it, you're there's within a your right. Sure. Yeah, there's a balance. You're within your rights to gauge how much time it's worth investing in this. I will definitely say, as much as it might be tempting, do not make something up. Because if it's me, and if I'm in a mischievous mood, I could wind up saying something like, well, this tartan represents the Battle of Falkirk. And my great-great-great-great-grandfather died there with a sword through his skull. And the colors of this kilt represent the grass that he fell on and the blood that spilled upon the grass. And and it gets me choked up every time I think about it. But, you know, you shouldn't do that. It's getting thick in here. Yeah, don't my don't readers? make stuff up. Yeah. Seriously, there's, a, there's enough mythology out there and unsubstantiated rumors about kilts um, stick with one of the two options that Rocky gave. Basically just yeah, a quick, make, make quick it as, and dirty. Yeah. As quick or as long as you want. Yeah. But, and if, if they give you a look <clears throat> or they feel weird or whatever, um, turn the question around on them and, and, you know, start. And if you want to get into it a little bit, start a little bit of a conversation, not confrontationally, just be like, Oh, are you Scottish? Do you have a family tartan and make it a little bit about them? And then their, yeah. their walls will come down a little bit. Um, sometimes that's what they're looking for is like, they're looking for validation because, you know, they want the excuse to say, Oh, well, actually I'm a steward. You know, they want to feel like you, you're the cool kid because you're wearing the kilt and they kind of want you to validate them. And that sometimes that's why they're asking the question. Yep. That's so, a good point. It's, yeah. they just want to, they think it's cool. They want someone to talk to about it. This is their way of opening up a dialogue. Yep. And if your, you know, first line back is no, it's not my family tartan. It was just pretty then mm-hmm. you've let them down. Mm-hmm. So it's, and it's, it's not that they're, you know, it's just a natural reaction. If they had an expectation going into the discussion, it meet their frequency yeah. fancy or whatever. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. So that's um, why I would have something like one of the other comments kind of on hand, ready to go mm-hmm. shoot at them. And you can, and I, I, I would tend to default to, it's not my clan, but I like this tartan. Um, not every clan has a registered tartan. Yeah. Yep. And not every, and just because you have a clan, doesn't mean you have to wear that tartan. You could wear a universal tartan and still wear your clan kilt pin on it, for instance. Um, so, yeah, there's any number of ways to play it. <clears throat> be gentle. You know, be kind to people. Don't be a jerk. So, be in, a jerk. in that case, we just had Thomas ask this question. Okay. Um, he's, his family tartan <clears throat> is McThomas. Mm. And uh, family tartan, McThomas wear a red tartan. Yep. Um, so, we do not have red tartans in ours. Uh, modern, ancient. Um so can he is there any rules or anything that he should be aware of if he goes to wear a red tartan and just to pick one and just go with it no i'd say pick a universal tartan um that you like and go with it and then if somebody says is that your clan tartan nope my tartan is mac thomas tartan i i would depending on your your comfort level with strangers again like to eric's point you don't need to justify anything you're doing to anyone who randomly walks up to you um, that being said, if you want to justify it you, and you don't have a McThomas tartan cause it's too expensive or, you know, you you can't, you haven't saved up to get it yet. And you just wanted a beater kilt and you're wearing a Royal Stewart. He just doesn't kilt. like the family tartan. Some guys don't like their family <clears throat> tartans. Well, so. it, let me finish my point first. If you haven't done, if you ha- if you're saving up for it, but I haven't gotten there yet, then just say, Nope, I'm saving up for my family tartan and a good kilt. This is Royal Stewart. I just really like that one, this one until I get my family tartan. If you hate your family tartan because it's hideous, 
um, then you just say, nah, I really didn't like my family tartan. It's garish. So I picked this one as my placeholder for, you know, what I choose to represent my Scottish heritage. Yeah. And, and again, you know, you can, you can wear that red tartan. If you just happen to like the color red, that's fine. Um, as, as we often mention here, clan specific tartans are a relatively new tradition compared to tartan itself as a technology. And if you go back 200, 300 years, guys were mixing tartans and it was a whole weird party color thing of, this is just happens to be what my wife wove last winter. So this is what I've got. This is a jacket I bought from some guy. It's a completely different tartan, but I really like the jacket and things were really funky. So it's, uh, you don't have to be hog tied by that. You pay homage to the tradition as much or as little as you want to. And as much or as little as you're able to based on finances and things like that. So yeah, yep. wear the red tartan if you want to. Yeah. Very good. That was a shaggy dog answer, but it was got my wolf, dander up. Wolf. Well, we we have had quite a few people ask us about PV tartans, and if there's anything new coming out this year <coughs> that you know might be out in the world that we want to share. Sounds, sounds familiar. Mm. Sounds like a topic that we were going to bring up around around now. Around now, actually. We do it. Okay, boys and girls. It's four o'clock. It's tartan time. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why it was disco. Um, <clears throat> we have a group over on Facebook called Kilts and Culture. We started the group to basically build a community. We wanted a place for people to mentor each other, to talk about tartans and stuff, where newbies can go and learn about things. Learn If they want to learn how to do something traditionally, but not get the, that's not how it's done, how dare you kind of attitude, but... They want some guidance, some gentle feedback, that kind of thing. There's a few different forums on the interwebs. Um, there's Facebook groups and whatnot. And some of them are either traditional leaning. Some of them are more contemporary. I'm going to wear what I want to wear. And they're fine. And I'm members of those groups too. Um, we wanted to do something that was a little more just friendly in general and kind of keep uh, keep the vibe just nice positive. and everyone just kind of positive. Yeah, And, and a big tent. Real, yes, you know, big tent, big tent, kind of, yeah, yeah. A good way of putting it. Okay. Um, so that group kind of grew out of this show and wanting to mentor and wanting to just kind of talk about all this stuff. The members started a coup. They needed a tartan. They had to have a tartan, something to represent the group as a whole. So, without further ado, we have designed. The kilts and culture tartan. We have to make. We have to have more better mouth noises. And Coraline, um, did you push the magic button? Coraline Yay. has pushed the magic button. So you're all seeing for the first time world premiere of the kilts and culture tartan. We are going to be doing it in uh, poly viscose fabric. We're also going to be doing a limited run in wool as well. Mm -hmm. So if you are in the group or you're seeing this and want it in wool. Speak now or hold your peace for at least a long time, if not forever. <laughs> um, and the PV, we're going to just kind of start stocking as one of our stock-supported tartans. Um, we just started taking pre-orders for it literally now. Um, so if you go to the website, you can check it out. Just search on Kilts and Culture. Uh, and we're right now in the weaving stage. We've approved the CAD design. Uh, mill so has so yet to... pre-order. Yeah, it's pre-order. Pre right now. The mill has yet to get back with the actual date when it should be delivered to us, but I'm assuming based on their general lead times, probably end of April ish for mm -hmm. making the kilts and out the door. Kind I think of thing. that's probably the main PV offering that we're bringing out new this year, at least Correct. as of now. Yep. That is, that is the big thing. And you don't have to be a member of the group to wear it. If we, we want something that had a nice rustic feel to it also. And you'll note uh, in the, the, the palette choices that basically it has that nice kind of rustic weathered uh, kind of weathered kind of look to it. Yep. So, and our operators are standing by to get your call. <laughs> <laughs> Hurry! <laughs> All right, enough of a commercial. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, hope you guys dig it. Um, yep. I designed it over the last... Uh, I actually wanted it to come out before Christmas, um, but I had a good time, went back and forth a good bit, um, talked to the mods about it a bit, talked to a few members of the staff here, came up with a few different iterations of it, and uh, this was the clear winner, hands down, by... Not quite unanimous vote, but pretty damn close to unanimous mm -hmm. vote. Yeah. So, yeah. cool. Enjoy. Awesome. Mr. Mac. All righty. So, <clears throat> so, 
Speaking of mods, we've got Kurt. Hi, Kurt. <laughs> he's uh he's got a question for uh, for us on Sporns. For dress Sporns, is there a big difference in chrome versus antique finish other than the other than the card other than <coughs> the color? Um, is one considered more formal than the other? No, it's really just personal preference. Yeah. Um, chrome was more popular, I would say, mm-hmm. um, just because it's uh, it's shinier and the buttons are shiny on the PC generally and that kind of thing. Um, but it, yeah, then at some point, I, I would I would this isn't a hard and fast fact. This is my 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 educated guess. At some point, it just kind of became cheapish looking to some people if i'm gonna put it that way Mm -hmm. um and a lot of guys kind of dug the more matted less less shiny less mirror finish um antiqued version of the metals um so that kind of came to the fore they've kind of been they sell effectively neck and neck it's not that one is you know sells 10 times better than the other um it's just a different another option another way to sell more sporns another way to give customers different options um, yeah, it's just people want options. People want to customize things. People want their own touch, their own exact tastes. So it's just a way to give people that. Yeah, I think the, the Chrome basically came about because they were trying to mimic silver. Maybe that's obvious, but yeah. essentially, um, silver was the metal of choice for formal, uh, Highland dress way back when, and it is expensive. I mean, it was, and that speaks to a degree about the level of society that was investing in those things in the first place. So especially for a formal occasion. You wanted to look very posh. You wanted to look well-to-do. Um, so Chrome seemed like an obvious choice from the manufacturer's standpoint to offer something to people. And I'm thinking like 50s and even, probably even further back than that. But I'm thinking 50s awesome. and 60s when it really probably became standard. Um, something that looked posh, but you could afford it. So oh, when did the... Uh, I'm trying to think when... Chrome's been around for a long time. But, was, but that's where I was going to go. When Highland is the electroplating dress, and all that kind of stuff? To, electroplating is, goes back way or, back, but... To the chrome plating technology, I'll put it that yeah. way. Yeah, do they have chrome um, in the turn of the century? I don't know. But uh, I, but I think that, but that's basically where the, came, the chrome came from. But yeah, um, it doesn't have the same uh, tarnishing effects in the crevices that silver does. So it doesn't have the same definition that silver will. And so and it doesn't it, get the same patina. That's what I mean. You yeah, don't have to you, you didn't get the patina. So it just didn't look the same. And over time, people got tired of it, and so the pewter became more popular. Um, now that I've said that, of course. Chrome will come back in a big way, and nobody will want pewter sporns anymore. But oh, no, not pewter, antique. Antique. Well, Correct. antique is supposed to look kind of like either look like pewter yeah, or matted. look like or yeah. look like tarnished silver. I guess you could yeah. say. But yeah, yeah. Bronze is it just the, gives it more definition. Bronze is the thing right now. Gives more detail to the design because yeah. of the the you know the the darkness in the crevices. Yeah. Um. The the bronze kind of the 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 chocolate bronze kind of color is a, a fashiony thing. I don't think that's going to have a whole lot of legs. But I think it'll be around for a little while yeah. um, in the same way that the the black, um, not black chrome, but like antique, but it's black, black, um, was popular for a hot minute. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I'd say anti- straight antique and straight chrome will be around for a while um, as, as people want more and more custom things and want things that are more unique and different. Um, I believe, it's my opinion, that they're going to see a lot more pewter cantles and pewter bits because it's a lot a it's not too expensive it's you know on on par with the cost of a chrome or an antique cantle um but the development costs are much much cheaper um you can get a pewter mold for you know a couple hundred bucks versus a stamp you know a brass stamp thing that has to stamp out for the chrome plated things Mm -hmm. um for the uh for the candles and whatnot so it's yeah, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go on record as saying I think there's gonna be more and more pewter cantles going forward. Okay, <coughs> Mac, you're trying to get our attention. 1924 is when chrome plating was invented. Okay, okay, that makes sense. That fits. That, that fits with what was in my brain. Okay, what mm-hmm. would they use it for originally? Um, metal, automotive, chrome plating metal bits. Just uh... it's an anti corrosion technology. Yeah, so was, I'm guessing for automobile stuff. Or not, yeah, it doesn't I don't have the whole article, but that. yeah, that's cool. Yep. Another reason I love the 1920s. God, I love the 20s. Hey, we're in the roaring 20s now. I know, I know. Been waiting for this for a long time. 
You got your little. Never mind. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, yes. Since we haven't brought it up yet, uh, what tartans are y'all wearing? I was about to say uh, we yes. should mention our tartans. Yeah. Uh, I got my County of Wexford. <clears throat> I'm breaking my usual advice to people by not covering up the bottom part of my tie. I usually say you should not wear a tartan tie with a tartan kilt unless you have some separation here. But it was warm and I was uh, mixing drinks, so I'm very casual. But uh, County Wexford, my favorite uh, Irish county tartan. I got my got my harps buckle matched too. Looks very pretty. I love this. Love this thing. The um, yeah, no, it's good. It's yeah, it's it was definitely warm in here. Yes, it's definitely warm in here. So did you have a sweater vest that you yeah. had on earlier? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have my sweater vest, but yeah. So that's why you're not wearing it. Yeah. Me, on the other hand, I was stupid. I just brought in a t-shirt and a sweater. So when it was time for the show, I get mm-hmm. to sweat. Um, yeah, you got the interesting tartan today. Yes. Right? Today I am rocking the. Is this the second ever? No, I guess he has two. Um, <clears throat> Scruffy Wallace, who was the uh, the the used to be the the bagpiper for Dropkick Murphys, is a buddy of ours, and we've done a few tartans with him and for him. This one, when he left the band, he ended up uh, as a sheriff up in Massachusetts, the, the Great Commonwealth, not state, the mm-hmm. Commonwealth mm-hmm. of Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. Um, and when he does, he bagpipes for his department. And, and a few different departments around him. And uh, when he bagpipes funerals in his you know, police gear, he wanted a tartan that matched his police gear. So I designed this tartan for him. I forget whether we registered it or not. Um, I designed the tartan. I had it woven, but I don't know whether I registered it or not. But um, yeah, so I don't... If it has a name, I forget what the name is. It is the Scruffy Wallace's Police Sheriff Tartan. I think it's as simple as that. Something like that. It's yeah. very, very much along that that line. Yeah. Swap foo. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's just fun. I just i I loved designing this particular one. I love playing with the the grays and the blacks in it, and then just a little hint of the blue color. Uh-huh. Um, so it was a it was a cool idea that he came up with and allowed me to kind of run with it. So yeah, eventually yeah. I figured I have a bunch of extra cloth. I need to make one for me because I like it. Yeah. So. We usually, usually I'll put a link in the comments about the tartans, you know, where you can find the tartans on our website. Not that one. Sorry. Wah, wah. It's all mine. And, yep. and, and, and scruffies. Scruffies. <laughs> yeah. Fine. Next question, Mr. Mac. Well, just to finish up, because there was also people, you can kind of see Coraline's. Uh, oh, in the, in the, Coraline. In there. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yes, uh-huh. Uh-huh. she has on the, uh, the Caledonia. Uh, and then I, it's from also for me walking on screen, I've got the Strathclyde blue on today. That's a really good point. We got to make sure we include these guys with this stuff from now on. So my apologies to you both. It, it just, Not it came up you. in the questions. People were asking for what all of us were wearing today. So mm-hmm. there you go. You guys look very pretty. You both do look, oh, especially look you, Mac. Look awesome. <laughs> 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 all right. All right, so we have Raymond. Uh, he is asking, can you chat about pleats, uh, like box pleating, and also the difference between a doing something to the stripe or to the set? I believe Raymond had asked that. Uh... Yeah, yeah. Raymond Nayert? Yes. Yeah, okay. Hi, Raymond. Check one off my list. Okay. The See, we did keep the questions. Yeah. Um, what, what was the actual question aside from chat about? <clears throat> Could you go into some depth on the topic of pleating? <laughs> For instance, set versus stripe. Also, box pleating, which I don't really know much about. Okay. So basically a rundown on pleating construction. Sure. Um, Try not to shaggy dog this too much. But. Me? Never. <laughs> um, you asked for it, Raymond. Here we go. The um, uh, the short, short version. Sorry. I'm channeling my inner space balls. There are a few different types of pleats that you can make for a kilt. The most common by far is knife pleating. Uh, knife pleating is when all the pleats basically go the same direction. For men's kilts, 99.9% of them, the pleats are going to go, as you're staring down at the floor, are going to go counterclockwise around the back of your body, wrapping this direction. For women's kilted skirts, they're typically knife pleated kilts, uh, or kilted skirts, they... Theirs can go either direction, just depends on the manufacturer. Um, for box pleating, box pleats mean that the that there's a there's a knife edge on both sides of the pleat. 
So it's going to fold in to the left and into the right. And then, you know, basically fan out to the next pleat. And then it kind of makes a Z shape. Um, like, a, like, a, like an hourglass. Like a Black Widow hourglass. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it's like Z's. Think of Z and then a backward Z facing it and then another right. backward Z and connect those back, forth, back, forth. That's if you're looking down the edge of a box plated kilt, that's how it's going to look. And the tops basically just barely touch and the depths of the pleat underneath inside barely touch in the backside. Um, there's something called a military box splitted kilt, which is kind of a, a mix between the two where it's a little, it's shallow, like one inch on one side and then about three inches deep on the other side. So it kind of goes back onto itself. Um, so those are the basic types of pleating. There's also canoe pleating um, or canoe pleating um, or reverse canoe pleating. If you know the brand Utila Kilts, um, they use reverse canoe pleating where all the pleats on the right hand side, or excuse me, on the left hand side, wrap around to the center of the back, and then the pleats on this side are knife pleated or a knife pleated and wrap around this direction to the back where they meet in the center of the back. A canusi pleat actually has a large box pleat in the center of the back, and then they knife and actually go forward around towards the front. Around towards the front right. the okay. Correct. So those are the basic styles of pleating. Um, not many kilt makers make kilts other than knife pleated kilts the majority make just knife pleated kilts some people kind of specialize in box pleats or those things or will do them but generally they cost a bit more because they're a lot more time intensive mm -hmm. um pleating styles meaning to the set or to the stripe um is basically just a matter of the pattern itself if you take a look at the tartan that i'm wearing here and you kind of squint at it the white stripe kind of jumps out at you that would be a good stripe to pleat to and when i say pleat to that stripe i mean every single pleat would have that white stripe down the center of every single pleat if it's pleated to the set then when you're pleating up the kilt you know manually in the sewing machine you're actually advancing one part of the pattern on every pleat so when you actually stack them all up it's going to look like the pattern itself it's pleated to the set or pleated to the pattern um, whereas a knife, or excuse me, a pl kilt pleated to the stripe, you end up, the front of the kilt looks different than the back, where the back just has a bunch of vertical stripes, and the front has the full pattern across it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Was that reasonably succinct? I think that was very good. That was very good. Um, the, uh, you want to discuss the origins of uh, pleading to the stripe briefly? I will let you do it. Uh, I'll probably get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Basically... Uh, a lot of it, I believe, Mac back me up on this, is military. Originally. Yeah. Um, if you need to adjust the the buckles on a kilt to make it smaller or a little bit bigger, it's easier to adjust on a kilt that's pleated to the stripe because you don't have to worry about the center back being off, the center back pattern, the, the stripe that runs in line with your spine being a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right. You can adjust it any amount and you're going to have those vertical stripes on every single pleat. So you have a hand-me-down kilt or mass-reduced kilt for a military context. So striped, pointing to the stripe was the desirable way to go Yep, and for, it's, for efficiency. Yeah, and it's generally a little bit easier, in my opinion at least, Mac, I don't know if you find it the same way, a little bit easier to sew kilts to the stripe because it's just you're doing the exact same thing over and over and over. But yeah, so, there's no, you don't have to think about <clears throat> what's going to be the center of the back and, and to go out from there or to think of the pattern. It's You're just... Yep, as long as the, got the line is and you're going dead center on the pleat, you just keep going. Mm -hmm. Yep, cool. Hopefully Mr. Mac. Well, I had I was just oh, uh, real quick. Well, sure? I just wanted to because we were on that topic, and I think you touched on this, but we had had a question a while back from uh, uh, Choice Yabara uh, asking, you know, if it made a difference which direction the knife pleats go. He had heard that to the left for men versus to the right for women was a thing, and I think you basically have dispelled that myth, but there used to be a myth out there that uh, <clears throat> knife pleats were a certain direction for men and another direction for women. Yeah, it's the knife pleats, when you're sewing a kilt, especially on a sewing machine, or if you're doing it by hand and you're right-handed, um, it's easier for the bulk of what you've created to be to your left, so you're sewing with your right hand. On a sewing machine, the arm of the sewing machine comes out and over, and the bulk of the fabric that you've done 
falls off the edge of the table and you're just working within the little arm of the sewing machine or underneath that arm. So it's easier for the pleats to go a particular direction for men's kilts. For women's, they're done both ways. There's there's no yeah. hard and fast, it must be this direction or it must be that direction. For men's, 99% of the time, the pleats go, as, again, if you're looking down, wearing the kilt, looking down, they point toward, you know, on the left-hand side, they wrap around towards the back, then on the right, they start coming forward. Um, that's how 99.9% .9 of kilts that are knife plated are plated for men. Women, I'd say it's it, it's probably 50-50, one direction or the other. No, there's no significance to it, no. basically. Okay. No. All right. <clears throat> Max coffee more than me today. Yeah, oh, I know. Have some more coffee. Hopefully, once I get through this junk, it'll be done with. I got some. Uh... Yeah, we got some. Uh, we got oh, some. God, that no. stuff should that stuff should cure anything. Oh. Uh, all right. Here's here's an interesting question. Um, Marcus is asking. He knows that we made some kilts for Madonna, and wondered if we get excited when we get entertainers or in the realms of music inside or out. That order that order kilts from us or order sure. accessories from us. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's it's always cool to have someone that you. Well, for the Madonna thing, I'll 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 <laughs> say this. I cared about the money and them paying. <laughs> Kelly, my wife, cared about the fact that Madonna was ordering kilts from us and thought it was really cool. So you're not a um, huge Madonna fan. No, no. Um, the he's not a material girl. No, <laughs> he's more of a Lady Gaga guy actually. The uh, <laughs> the what I will say was cool was when we actually uh, they gave us tickets to the show so it was cool to see the audience reaction to the uh, to her and the dancers and Lauren the dude the tall bagpiper dude all wearing our kilts on stage and the the positive you know just wow factor that everyone else had in seeing that that was neat. That yeah. to me meant more than the fact that Madonna was wearing the thing. Mm -hmm. um, it is cool when, when it's, I'll say it this way. I'm trying to be honest, as honest as I can about this. If it's somebody, if it's a celebrity that I don't care about, it's like, great, cool. Here's your stuff. And we're going to give them the same level of service. We're going to give them to anybody else. Cause everybody's um, a rock star when you shop with USA kilts. <laughs> the, um, Sorry, we get TV shows order and stuff on occasion. Right. Um, it's it's really more of a pain in the butt, especially for TV shows because they're always Outlander. they need them. Well, no, not even that because um, yeah. we didn't do anything for the show itself for the production. And it was still a pain in the butt. Well, true. That's just because they wanted a billion of this mm -hmm. stuff. Um, but when you do a, a kilt for a TV show, most time production companies need something, and then the time they cast the actor and get everything, you know, finalized in the script and know what they actually need and get the dimensions, yep. you know, waist hips length of the actor. It's like, okay, well, we need this tomorrow. Can you overnight, can you make it tonight? Stay late and then yeah. overnight it. Yeah. Or we need it in two days. So we need you to come in early tomorrow so you can get it out on the first UPS truck. And it's just ridiculous. The time frames that they want them in. Mm -hmm. I'm going off on a tangent and ranting about this stuff now. That's, that's, um, people are paying for, are they paying for this? You're not paying for this. You're no. paying YouTube for this. Maybe I don't know. the, no, but it's, it's cool, it's neat, it's fun to have, to see your stuff in the media. It's see, it's cool to see a celebrity or somebody wearing your stuff. It, it's fun. Yeah, it's fun. But at some point, it's, not, it's, if I don't like the person or like the show, I'm like, okay, fine, whatever, and we'll do it. Yeah. But it's it's more fun when I like the guy. Like when we did, you know, Scruffy's Kilt from Dropkick Murphys. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. was just, oh, it was you know, our first year in business, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. So that really meant something to me um when we did a kilt for the show the office um when on the jim and pam wedding episode that was super cool we did it for brian boitano's christmas spectacular one year and i didn't care like i'm not an ice skater <laughs> so that didn't you know didn't grime or what's it what, not grind my gears it's the bad one that's um, a bad one uh, uh, didn't get me all excited uh, i don't want to go there yeah yeah so anyway this, yeah, it's just it's yeah, I don't know. You and I don't tend to be starstruck. Star Trek. Yeah, we're not really. We've been too subcultural in our lives to be really. Yeah. Woo, yeah. Famous person, you know. But but if they're cool, or if there's a cool story, I mean, like the guy from the Doobie Brothers, 
he just he was a cool guy you know he was a really nice guy and 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 it turned into one of these stories where you were helping him do something he'd always wanted to do you know and that that there's a lot of customers like that but yeah uh, you know, i'll say this it's, it's fun it's neat um it means more to me and it's it's more neat i guess um when it's the the person themselves ordering something or contacting us versus a company on their behalf yeah that's more fun when you get personal interaction with the person yeah. and you get to see that they're a cool guy. Like right. Eric saluting John McPhee, uh, the John guitarist McPhee. Right. from the Doobie Brothers, is a <clears throat> like an honestly nice human. And <laughs> the, the 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 quick funny story with his was he ordered a jacket. We didn't know he just ordered a jacket through the website. We sent him the jacket and the sleeves were like four inches too long. And we, you know, he took pictures of himself in the jacket, showed it to us. You know, we were, you know, we just treated him like a normal customer. Sorry about that. Something got screwed up. He sent it back. You know, we paid to send it back to us, sent it back, had it fixed, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, treated him nicely as I would expect to be treated if a company screwed something up on, you know, on my order. Um, and when I got to talking to him about it and he just said, you know, as the most sincerely nice guy, um, he said, you know, hey, you know, I'm in, I'm in this little band, and I don't know if you've ever heard of us, but you know, next time we're out in your area, if you ever want to come see us, I'd love to meet you. I'd love to have you to one of the shows. And I said, "Oh, what band are you in?" And he's like, "Oh, a band called the Doobie Brothers." And I was just like, "Are you kidding me?" Um, so he's an honestly wonderful human being, um, and that is always really cool to see yeah. when you meet someone who is famous, who is down to earth, who really is a nice person, and just a, a normal guy. I think it's 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 more exciting for me, just as a as a as a history person, um, when there's a story behind why the person's getting the kilt. Um, if somebody's getting it as a prop, we've definitely had experiences where, like you said, where where they want it for a theater production or something, and it's just a it's just a thing to them. You know, it's it's just a cool little bit of color, shtick, or it's shtick, or it's like, well, you know, we're doing Brigadoon, we gotta have kilts. Um, if it's a personal story, that is a lot more interesting. And we've had some really cool, very interesting people come in to the store over the years um, to get kilts for a variety of reasons. And, and that's, that's the fun part for me. I always was working in the, in the sales room was basically getting to hear the story of these people, you know, how they got into it in the first place. Yeah, that's, or that's, like that's the, awesome. the weddings yeah. where it's like Scottish and Native American weddings that we've done. Or the yeah, people yeah. that, you know, the first the first uh firefighter memorial tartan kilt that we had that was uh the guy had got a wedding and it had was married on antarctica like mm -hmm. <laughs> down there so yeah. we have a picture of him and his bride outside in antarctica with penguins um right. so it's right. just ridiculous like those kind of things yep. are as cool if not cooler mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. a, a a production company saying hey we need an order tomorrow for the tv yeah. show thing yeah that's that's the cool thing about this that's the awesome thing yeah i'm rambling Anyway, it's fine. It's a good ramble. More questions? Well, we they're still rolling in. Why am um, I not surprised? <laughs> Thank you, everybody. So, we have the Super eighty one millimeter one. What is the proper type of dress you can wear with an animal mask born? Anything. Anything. A the a semi dress born or a an animal mask for or full mask. Or animal head, head on, whatever you yeah. want to call it. Head Sporn. on, full mask. Yeah. Um, the <laughs> applied directly to the forehead. <laughs> applied directly to the forehead. Um, uh, <laughs> head on, applied directly to the forehead. A full mask sporn. You can wear day wear, or you can wear formal. There's no right or wrong answer there. You can wear it, you know, to a a, a Prince Charlie black tie event. You can wear it to a Celtic festival during the day. The I would say my only personal take on it is I would I think it would look a little bit much, and that's the best way to put it. It's just a bit much wear worn with a t shirt and a kilt. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. That kind of thing. But you could. There's no hard and fast rule that you can't. Um the what I would probably pair it with would be, you know, a, a tweed vest and a pair of kilt hose. Yeah. Something that level. Yeah. Um but it's most of the time people don't wear it to something that informal, that casual, because if you're at a Celtic festival, you're going to get grease on it or beer on it or something like that. And they ain't cheap. Yeah. 
I mean, there are some guys who make it themselves, you know, like like Aiden Crawford and people like that who make their own animal pelt stuff. Um, they might be more cavalier about it because they know what went they can into make it. Another, and yeah. Not, yeah, and they can always make another one. But for a lot of guys, a uh, a full mask sporin is an investment. So you want to keep it for special occasions. I do think I agree. It looks a little bit much for casual wear. It kind of also depends on the pelt. Like if it's a very short nap pelt animal, then I think it's more flexible. If it's a big fluffy thing, it looks weird with a casual, even weirder with a, a more casual outfit. Whereas if you've got the big going on formal outfit with the really fancy jackets and the really fancy day plate or fly plate and you know and all this kind of stuff, then a big honking in your face fluffy fox sporing, you know, Arctic fox doesn't look out of place. I'd but, say the majority of them are fluffier though. Yeah, like so fox, I think that's what they badger. Just look, they look odd to me. I don't disagree. If the rest of the clothing is not over the top, peacocky. equally over the top. Yeah. yeah, that's that's how I feel about it. Cool. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, but but is there a rule about it? No. Yeah. Gauge your sporing before you go out. I guess. Mister Mac. Oh, we're gonna. Should I do? <clears throat> we have a half an hour left. I should be talking to them, not you. I think we should do some Half an hour? questions. Do some of these questions. That's what from she's saying. From the magic clipboard. Okay. Okay. We're going to do some questions from the magic clipboard. I do have one question that I want to get to you. Right, well, I want to get I, to I, you, Coraline's, Eric. Okay. Coraline's later. trying to help us out here, but Mac, I blame you because you're not removing the duck. Well, the, hey, these okay. are questions right, out okay. the wall. Crowd's, right. crowd's asking questions. All right. All right. Our public <laughs> yeah. demands. You got to do the rapid fire show sometime. Yes, Mac. How may I help no, no. you? No, uh, no. You, you, you can read some of your questions. Yeah, read your little question there, Eric. But I do have one question I want to get to you eventually. Okay. All right. One I think is up your alley. Okay. Fine. Okay. We're very rambunctious I'm going to read it. I'm going to read I think it's the coffee. <laughs> Irish coffee for the win. Uh, <laughs> Not for the win. Oh, my goodness. Um, I'm going to dovetail, since we were just talking about the wearing a full head uh, or, or full mask sporn casually, um, Edward Montgomery, um, uh... Monty had actually kind of, he had said uh, a similar question. He said, I've always been puzzled that people can get so nitpicky about things like flashes and belts with vests and hose height and all those other details. And yet nobody ever seems to ask, why are you wearing a formal dress sporn with a t-shirt at a family barbecue? And and I think that dovetails with what we were just talking <coughs> about. So Yeah. Um, and your t-shirt with a dress sporn. Yeah. Why do people do that? The... Do people do it? Yes. Do they do it well? No. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would say this. It's the my my guess is it's done for a few reasons. One, they don't know what they're doing, and they just they're trying to figure it out, and they're just you know they're getting out there and doing the best they can, mm -hmm. and you know, bonnie to them. Um, the or bully, sorry, bully. Um, the uh, sorry, my Scottish. <laughs> The A, so that's what they're doing. Or B, that's the only sporin they have. Yeah. Um, so that's what they're wearing. There's a lot of inexpensive, poorly made generally, but inexpensive yeah. dress sporins. Yeah. And guys in their minds say, ooh, look, that, that one's pretty. I like that one. That's and, fancy. And it's only 20 bucks. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's that element as well. Another potential is guys <clears throat> get married in their kilt and then figure, hey, I need you no, know, so they get a full formal outfit, Prince Charlie, dress born, kilt, you know, hose flashes, Gilly Brogues, the whole nine. And then they decide, hey, I haven't worn my kilt for a while. It's family barbecue. I'm going to wear my kilt. And then they realize they don't have any other sporin other than their dress sporin. So by default, that's what they're wearing. Yeah. Or it's, they feel like they've spent so much money on a nice dress sporin that they need to get more use out of it because. I spent two hundred fifty dollars on this freaking thing. I'm gonna wear it. Um, so unfortunately, it kind of flies in the face of tradition a little bit. It would be like wearing, you know, patent leather shoes with, you know, with jeans. It's a bit not done. It's a bit off. Um, so that's yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in a nutshell. Yeah. Um, do you do anything about that, or are you just gonna smile and nod and? Uh, that's one of those where it's, I don't, 
I would mostly assume that they are having that there's a problem involved with why they did it or ignorance involved, and I wouldn't want to call them on it because it'd be yeah. There, it'd be there's rude. there's certain things I will. I feel like I can mentor and guide people and not call them out on it. Like, hey, buddy. But when I was like, hey, did you know? Um, so wearing the pleats backwards at a festival. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I will absolutely tell someone, hey, did did you know the pleats actually are supposed to go in the front? Just so you know, you have your kilt on backwards. And kind of lean in, say it quietly, and mentor the person a little bit. Now, that's a clear, obvious yay or nay. For the dress born, you, it's there's more of a potential backstory or reason why they have to do it. Yeah. So I would see that as a little bit more rude to just go up and assume something right. that the guy you know doesn't know what he's doing and kind of right. say something there. Yeah. So if somebody is posting a picture of themselves, say in in the group online, and they're proud of the fact that they've kilted up, and they're doing that, they've got the the, the fur dress born on with their clan T-shirt, standing in the backyard. Is there a graceful way to react to that, or do you just kind of let it go as as yes. you, you do you, you know? The way, for those, the way I've always treated um, critiques, the best way to critique anyone or deliver bad news or a, a bad review or something like that is sandwiching the bad news between good news. So I would say, hey, I love it. your example. Clan t-shirt, you know, clan kilt, dress born pair of sneakers i'd be like dude i love your casual look it, you're rocking it it's really cool looks like you're having a great time one minor note if you don't mind me you know being a little bit forward typically a day sporn might fit in a little bit more with the casual level of your outfit that being said it's awesome that you're repping the clan you got your t-shirt on good on you mm-hmm. so if you sandwich a critique a minor one one not 27 yeah. one critique yeah Pick the major one if there's multiple issues wrong with an outfit. But sandwich one critique between two compliments or two attaboys. Um, it generally goes a lot better because mm-hmm. people aren't as you know offended or, or taken aback yeah. that you're saying something. You, you bring their walls down by saying something nice. You offer a little bit of constructive criticism and then you build them back up with a nice comment at the end. I agree. I like to stress the constructive part too. I think um, when I'm critiquing somebody about something like that, um, you straight up say, do you mind constructive critique? Well, no, that's part of it. But I was going to say, I try to couch it in terms of um, how I think it could be a benefit to them. Like, say, for instance, in this example, I'd say, you know, like, the dress born is cool. You may find that a day sporn would be less to worry about. And you wouldn't have to worry about something happening to your sporn if you wore a day sporn at the festival instead of the dress born. You might feel, might feel more secure if you keep that reserved for special occasions so nothing happens to it. Um Something along those lines. So I feel like I'm trying to give them a pro tip. Agreed. You know, as opposed to a smack down, a try to a boost up. You know what I mean? Understood. It's or or, or you got guts wearing a dress sporn at a festival, man. I wouldn't do it. I'd be too, too worried about something happening to the ch- happening to the chains or something like that. The the only thing I would uh, I would worry about that is are they going to get the hint? Because the, the online re- communication sucks. I hate yes. doing any of this online. That's why I'm saying but... it's, it, in certain circumstances, it's better, in my opinion, to go a little bit more direct and okay. give a direct critique. Because in playing your scenario out for a sec, the guy has a thirty dollar dress born, and mm-hmm. you say, you know, hey, I'd worry about you know getting it mucked up, you know, blah. You might want to reserve that and just wear a leather one where you could wipe it off if something spills on it. Nah, it's only thirty bucks. It's fine. So that's why I'm I'm generally more of a direct and to the point, but sandwich it mm-hmm. okay. as a as a methodology. I'll buy that. I'll buy that. Yes. Yeah. Okay, but cool. yours would work too. Okay. Should I do another one? Yeah, or... let's do another one too. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna link two together because I can. Um, Fancy, getting tricky. Yeah, yeah, and and again, we've touched on this before, but we had uh, uh, Sergio Santos who's on YouTube, and he was saying, "What's your opinion about someone wearing a kilt?" who has no heritage connection to kilts. And I'm going to link this to a question from uh, Enos, who said, who asked if any of us here at the company have a direct Scottish heritage. Um, and if so, from where in Scotland specifically, how many of us have family tartans, family clan connections of our own? <clears throat> so I think, I think we can, this is, this is a mantra of ours to, to a degree about whether, yeah, you, know, you can wear a kilt or not if you're not Scottish. Yeah, and we are kind of examples of that in this building. 
Yeah. Also, the uh, a lot of our we are a mixed bag here at USA Kilts. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we are in the middle of not quite middle, but the edge of Pennsylvania Dutch country. There's a lot of Germans in this area. There's a lot of Welsh in this area. It's a, a big. It's not a, str- a Scottish stronghold, as it were. So, for employees, which you know we have to pull from the pool around us, um, there's not a direct strong Scottish community here. Um, it's a mixed community of other European type stuff and other communities or, or not ethnicities, heritage kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and just that's kind of how it is in America in general. There's just a lot of people who it's have always a mixed heritage. Depending, yeah. yeah, depending on where you are. Period. Um, none of us are from Scotland. None of us um, have, you know, their, all of their parents were from Scotland. Um, it's, we're all mixed to some degree. Some of us have zero Scottish, and that's fine too. Yeah, I started the company just by obsessing about kilts and Celtic music and that kind of stuff. I don't really have Scottish ancestry that I know of. I have a bit of Irish, and I'm mostly German. But I just, something about the kilt, something about the culture spoke to me. And the more I kind of peeled back the layers of the onions, the more I wanted to know, the more I obsessed about it. Um, so I basically, my entire life was consumed by learning about Scottish stuff, and then learning about kilts, and then learning about how to make kilts, and then constructing them myself, and trying to figure different things out, just the way my brain is wired. So, and then the more I learned about it, the more excited I got. And I, you know, started a company with my wife and 15, 17 years later, here we are. Yep. Um, what's your, how'd um, you come to it? I got into, angle? I got into kilts and, and all that as an outgrowth of uh, being a history, you know, goober. Um, I have uh, Campbell on my father's side and Stuart on my mother's side. But uh, those are further back in the line, and I have pretty much equal parts of uh, German and English, and Norwegian is in there also. So yeah. um, I'm Northern European guy genetically, um, but uh, I've always been drawn to uh, Gaelic, Celtic, and British history, uh, and so I and I've always been drawn to tribal culture, uh, both my own roots and uh, any tribal cultures in the world. Really, just I admire. Um, the, the strength of those of those things and so um, that's kind of how I fell into it and uh, when I realized hey I've got I do have some connection to this stuff then that just amped up my interest even more so so yeah I have days where I'm feeling very much yes today is a Stuart Tartan day brah. and then I have other days where it's like yeah I'm feeling more you know just kind of out in the woodsy kind of primitive guy you know so I'm gonna crank some metal tunes and wear you know a util kilt but uh, it's uh, so I'm a mix in that sense um, but it's definitely the the heritage and the sense of a pre modern mindset that got me into it. Well, you know what I mean. Yeah, it's a little hard to describe. But what was the first question again? Um, how how do we feel about people who don't have a Scottish connection <clears throat> wearing kilts? Pretty damn good. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I don't have a Scottish connection really. I love wearing kilts. The what it boils down to is something we say a lot. It really depends on. The, the angle and where your heart's at coming to it. Are you a sincere student of the culture? Right. Are you doing it for the right reasons? Are you doing it for wanting to further the culture, wanting to steep yourself in it, wanting to learn about it versus wanting to be a caricature of it? Right. Um, if you are a sincere student of the culture and you're really, really into it, you can do all kinds of stuff. Hell, I have a show about it now. Yeah. Um, so it's it really just matters about your your level of how much you want to learn, how much it means to you and how much you're just giving it lip service. Mm -hmm. These guys want to chime in? Mac? I mean, as far as, I mean, um, I've said it on here millions of times. I'm I'm the PA Dutch. I'm the Dutchie in the group. Mm -hmm. Uh, Grew up in Southern Lancaster County. So I'm Scotch, Irish, German, through and through. Um, but I mean, I've got I got into the whole, the whole aspect just um, when I was dating my wife. Uh, my wife um, came out to the shop and she said, "Hey," or I came out to, out this way. She's like, "Hey, there's a kilt shop in town," and I was like, "Oh, really? I know I have Scottish ancestry. Let's 
I'll go check it out. And then ended up buying a kilt while I was there. So it just <laughs> kind of never let him leave. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I kind of got locked in after that. But uh, no, nah, it was just one of those deals where I always had an interest in, I've always had an interest in history. Um, so it just, it just, it was an easy fall in too. Mm-hmm. You had some connection. Mm-hmm. Indeed. Yeah. Cool. It, the, the commonality here um, for, for the majority, the vast majority of our, of our employees is we all love this stuff one way or another. Mm-hmm. Either either we love sewing or we love kil- kilts and Celtic stuff or yep. we you know love a mixture of it. It's or we just love the culture aspect of it or we love bagpipes. There's there's a reason why it speaks to all of us um, here as well as you know out there. So it's when you lean into it, this is what you get. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking we got like at least three Irishmen. We have an Anderson, um, who that's yeah, not yeah. actually his Scottish song. Yeah, I know that was funny when I found that out. Yeah, but uh, um, a yeah, lot it's of crowds, it's a, a lot mix. of Germans. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a mix. Yep, but uh, a respectful mix. I think that's the key. yeah, so, yeah, yeah, a good mix. Should we go back to you, or should I keep going? Well, we can throw that one in that uh, that I have bookmarked. <laughs> we have enough for time you. for about okay. two more. Yeah, and then, then, then we're doing our. Uh, the Americans try haggis. Speaking of employees at USA Kilts, we made uh, many TV stars out of our employees. So you're going to get to see a bunch of different people that work in the building trying haggis for the first time, mm-hmm. potentially the last time for some of them. This is part of, part of our ramping up for Burns Night. Yeah. In case you're wondering. So. All right, right, Mac. One All right. more from right. you, then one more from Eric. Yeah. So, so David is asking. Make sure I'm ready. Okay. Can you mix the greaser rockabilly look with the kilt? Yes. Yeah, I think you could. <clears throat> it's going to come off to most guys as more punk. Um, I'd be careful. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't it, do. I wouldn't do uh, cowboy boots that you can do in the rockabilly thing. I would definitely do combat was boots. Directed at me. I know, but I'm chiming in on that. In my guess. I gave my answer. Yes. Yes. <laughs> There's my answer. No, I, 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 I pick, I'm picking up what you're putting now. I would not do cowboy boots. Might be able to do uh, two tone shoes of some kind. Um, Are you? A, how uh, into rocky? Let's, let's back this up a bit. I'm not much of a rocky builder. See, guy. I was. Okay. That's why I jumped on it. See, I don't know. The, well, Max, Max said it was a question for me. I know. I figured this would be the more perception than, is like, that I was the, going no. like the greaser. Dude, Tiger Army, Necromantics, you know, the uh, Brian Setter Orchestra. There's all kinds. Dude, psh. See, the Rocky's 50s. dropping the, the mic and walking the, the, along. Yeah, the 50s to me <laughs> is like Louis Prima, not not Elvis. So, you know. Um, that's, Coron, Coron's like, oh, my God. What did you just do to my audio track? Um, no, I, I, what shirt would you do, though? Could you do a bowling shirt, or would you just stick with a t-shirt and a leather? I'd, I'd stick with a uh, white t-shirt, black t-shirt, band yeah. shirt. Yeah, um, band, you band could do a pompadour. Um, I've got like a mechanic shirt on over here. Yeah, mechanic yeah. shirt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I think it's like a bowling shirt with the stripes going down. Oh, you I mean, can't decide like if I'd the, like that. Uh, the the two and a half men. Um, yeah, was, Charlie Sheen. Charlie yeah. Sheen yeah, shirt. Yeah. That's no, I wouldn't do a bowling shirt with it. No. Um, no, or, but you could do a a solid color black or a band shirt. Yeah. Um, just yeah, kind of along the lines of a punk rockish kind of look. That's my thing. I just feel like combat boots, kilt, a regular day sporing. Yeah, that's what I'm um, saying. I don't think you could do straight up rockabilly. I think it would come off to most to the casual observer looking at you. They think you were doing more of a punk rock thing. It would really boil down to your hair. I was if you say throw a pompadour hair, on with it, the hair is going to be the weird. You're part. fine. Yeah. I don't know if I would dig it. I don't. That'd be crossing the streams for me personally. But I, I get a little OCD like that, so I don't know. But uh, yeah, it would it would be. Was a, this a question from you, or was this a question from no, a customer? This, this came in. Okay, it would be a, right. it would be a little tougher than I think I'm giving it credit. I think it would be a little bit tougher to pull off. Um, but it would just be a straight up casual type look. Um, yeah, because I mean, kilts have been a part of the punk scene since the beginning. Yeah, I mean, it, it would end up lo- even though if you weren't, tr- it's. A lot of those those types of scenes, whether it's punk, whether it's metal, whether it's rockabilly, whether it's oi, all that's a lot of it overlaps. Yeah, absolutely. So there, there's a lot of commonality. Jeans, leather jacket, plain color shirt. Mm-hmm. It's the uniform. Yeah. 
So it really, for that, boils down to hairstyle, which is kind of why yeah, I went with I the, agree. as long as you have a pompadour or something rockabilly-esque, okay. Um, I think the tattoos are a, are a big deal also. The style of tattoos you go Style for. of tattoos. Yeah. Having tattoos, all of them have tattoos. Yeah, but I mean, but, the style specifically. Yeah, yeah. definitely Old nautical, yeah. you know, old school. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay. Yeah, so. Hmm. If you have a, a Johnny Cash throat tattoo, <laughs> that says rockabilly. You're getting that next? <laughs> Don't tempt me. Kelly would kill me. Um. Yeah. I don't know. But yeah, rockabilly is not one of my one of my scenes. So, I I appreciate your input. It is on mine. the topic. But uh, sorry, yeah. I jumped on you. That's all right. It's all right. Um, and yeah, more I think about the uh, the bowling chair is more of a swing thing than a, yeah. than a rockabilly thing. So that's yeah. irrelevant anyhow. <laughs> Rockabilly version of uh, uh, of uh, uh, Amazing Grace or mm. Motorhead or, did a rockabilly album. They, they, the the uh, the but that's what? not Scottish. And I'm t- I'm thinking Scottish national tunes or I know I know or Irish. Re- I'm just thinking yeah, the Irish random tunes, rockabilly stuff. You know? Headcat. It was the Brian Setzer Orchestra with Lemmy. Okay. Horrible album. I love Lemmy. Horrible album. <laughs> <laughs> um. Let's see. Uh, Mara Morris asked us, what is your procedure, personally, for making your outfit ready to wear before you go out? For example, uh, do you starch anything? Do you have any tricks for removing lint? What sort of details do you worry about or do you feel people overlook before they leave the house for the day? If you're if you're doing your thing in the, in the morning. Yeah, um... Say so make sure your shoes are polished. Um, if you know, if you're so inclined, mm-hmm. the um, I, I'd really say it just kind of. I've been I've been wearing kilts for 17 years, so it's kind of second nature. Um, so I, I don't have a routine other than well, a I have a very very keen eye for detail. I will say that. So if some even if a minor thing is wrong, I will pick it out and see it. Um, <clears throat> to the detriment of some of the people who work here, um, the, uh, uh, but no, it's, I'll just basically just get myself dressed in the closet. know what I'm going to be wearing that day. I'll, you know, pick my, uh, my kill hose out of the drawer, pick the flashes I'm going to want to wear. And then I'll just look at myself in the mirror just to make sure it's kind of sorted. Um, and then, you know, when I'm putting on my kill hose, making sure that I'm adjusting the flashes to the proper position while I'm putting the hose on not just kind of throwing the flashes on, but I try to pay attention to the minor details as I'm doing them so that when the time you stand up and your outfits together, it looks good as a full outfit. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just, to me, it just boils down to kind of just sorting myself out throughout the day, uh, making sure there's no, you know, dust or flakes or anything, um, making sure that, you know, my beard is trimmed nicely, but that's not really kilt related. That's yeah, just general um, grooming. Yeah. I think general grooming kind of is, is an answer. Is is uh, you know build in build thinking about the parts of your outfit into your general good grooming habits. You know, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything specific that I would recommend. I mean, I have a lint brush that I keep handy if I need it, and just try and check. Um, it's really helpful to have really good lighting in at least one room of your house. I have a problem at my house where I have very dim lighting in a lot of the rooms, not a lot of natural light. So um, having bright lights in the bathroom is, is definitely helpful. So make sure you're, if you're blurry eyed at six in the morning, you're trying to make sure that your shirt doesn't clash with your tartan. It's good to have some good light for that. Um, and other than that, not a lot. I tend to put the kilt on last or almost last so I can get the kilt hose and flashes done first and make sure they're perfect, you know, without having the fabric in the way when I'm looking at stuff. Um, yeah, pretty simple for me. But. Yeah. 
there's, there's not a lot to it. Just, you know, pay attention to what you're doing. I don't really have any, like, starched. He asked specifically I don't, about yeah, starch. I don't starch you know, anything. I don't, my shirts, I don't really starch. I don't wear neckties a lot. Um, oftentimes, if I'm wearing a, a button-up shirt, I'll just leave the top undone with a vest and, you know, rolled-up sleeves kind of look. I'm a little bit more casual, dressy-ish um, as, mm-hmm. as a style. Um, if I'm going out for formal, then, yeah, I'll make sure my, you know, my top button's done. I'll have my, you know, the wing collars folded down appropriately. The bow tie is nice and centered. The band is straight around the collar and that kind of thing. Not too tight that it's crimping the collar. Um, right. Little details like that, but those are, yeah, I'll make sure my kilt pin's in the right position. But it's just a matter of just, you know, picking, paying attention as you're putting together each part of the outfit individually, and then the whole thing comes together by itself. Yeah, I think the more you, the more habitual you are about wearing the kilt and the stuff that goes with it, um, the less you need to think about this stuff. It, it becomes second nature, like you were saying. Yep. Um, I would say uh, just keep an eye on the uh, the maintenance level or the, the the fatigue factor. I might say of your various items. Like um, you can be really well put together, but if you got a really nasty ring around the collar or underarm stains on your shirt that kind of detracts so those are the kind of details i'd look at you know like um is the is the edges of the leather on your sporn getting worn like have you had it for like 20 years and it's really starting to look ratty little things like that just maintenance level things or or fatigue of the material kind of things is what i think about i would say this the 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 ring around the collar thing absolutely um two if you're going to be going out and for a formal evening or somewhere where you don't want to you may be hot and you might sweat, I'd say put on an undershirt so that it kind of right. absorbs, you know, pit sweat kind of right. thing. Um, for the sporin, there is a, there's a warmth and a, a something to having a, day, a well-worn day sporin. Sure. Um, like if you I look agree. at Prince Charles sporin, it is an old sporin. And actually mm-hmm. the hunting sporin is what I'm thinking of. The actual, the, the one, I believe it's the far left, or one, one of the ends, the leaf is actually torn on it if you look closely at the photo. Interesting. But he still wears it because okay. it was his father's or grandfather's sentimental. or whoever's form. Yeah, it's a okay. sentimental thing. Okay, um, that's cool. I would say that doesn't translate nearly as well to dress borns, where if you have a an old, uh, uh, like let's say, sealskin dress born, it's from the 1930s, and the sides have been rubbed bare yeah. from wearing it on a kilt and sitting down and getting up and moving around, that's going to look sloppier than a well-worn, well-loved dress or day sporn. Gotcha. Okay. But it's also day sporns for casual where it's, it's okay to be a little bit less crisp, a little softer on the edges versus formal, which is more, you know, Mm -hmm. pristine. Mm -hmm. Also, you know, he's a prince. He can kind of do what he wants. It's true. Yeah. He has good style though. He does. Say what you will about him. No, he really does. Yes. He's definitely uh, a poster boy. For us in many respects yeah. indeed quite yeah. all right okay the moment everyone has been waiting for do americans like haggis do americans know what haggis is will they violently react you're about to find out miss Coraline. roll it it is its own thing that i have never tasted before <laughs> Today, we're going to try haggis. Have I ever had haggis before? You asked many times. I've had it on a few few occasions as well. The one that I had was not a good experience, but then it wasn't a good haggis from what I understand. I have never had haggis before. I've never even heard of it until like last month. No, no. I've never had legitimate haggis before. This is a first for me. I've never even had fake haggis. All right. <laughs> Yes, I have also had haggis before. I am actually a veteran of the competitive haggis eating competition. I don't know what haggis is made of. I assume it's made of edible animal parts, but <laughs> I'm not too sure of that either. I have a small understanding of what it was, what's in it. Sheep sheep guts with spices and oatmeal wrapped up in a oatmeal. lovely lovely little sheep case. Looks like a praying mantis cocoon. The other parts that nobody else eats, from what I understand. It is the intestines of sheep, lamb, other animals, wrapped in stomach, baked. It's it's basically just oats, meat, seasonings, and then, you know, it's all uh, boiled inside of a, a casing of one sort or another. Uh, 
I'm getting a stomach ache already. <laughs> <laughs> We're about to eat it, and I don't want to think about that too much. I think I'm really going to like it. I'm hoping that this will be a better haggis than what I had before. I'm a carnivore, so I'm hoping it just because there's meat in it, all of it. <laughs> it would be a new experience for me. I'm really hoping. I love the barbecue. I love eating all kinds of meat, so I'm hoping I do like it. I have a very strong gag reflex. Like, once I think I don't like anything, I can't, like, contain it. So I, I have to like this or... Or I'm gonna bomb. Yeah, aim that way. <laughs> this is awesome. Ooh. Fancy feast. It looks like dog food. It, yeah, actually kind of resembles dog food. It looks like it smells. Very similar to Science Diet canned dog food. I don't know, what would Gordon Ramsay think of this presentation? It's got quite a bit of oats in there. It smells pretty good. I don't know, but I'm sure he'd throw a f in here somewhere. <laughs> Not that hungry. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look that bad, really. It looks so it looks bad. <laughs> Definitely smells spicy. There's no jiggle. <laughs> it it yeah. looks like a meaty oatmeal mixture. It smells pretty good. Yeah. I'm I'm ready to dive in. Oh, you're going for that first. I need to prep the palate. Just trying to smell that and get the <laughs> scent of that out of there. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm just gonna have it. Touch. Oh, oh my god! Let's start with this. Yeah. Is it too early to drink? No. Good. It's never too early to drink. Not when you're eating haggis. Since it's only nine o'clock, are we capped at just one serving of uh, of scotch, or uh, can I go in for seconds? See, I'm I'm enticed to try the haggis now because that tastes so bad. One for the money, two for the show. Okay, just do it. Ready? Yep. Slanja. Huh. Oh. Yeah, no. Oh, it's pretty crumbly. Yeah, it just crumbles apart. I think it's pretty good, actually. Kind of like meatloaf? Because of the onions, maybe? Yeah. Yeah? And the grains in it were very, uh, very pronounced. It's got kind of a dense... Like an oody taste. It's so weird to chew because it's like not a solid. Hmm. That's actually not bad. Let's let's let's, let's uh, have the haggis drink a little. Enjoy some Ooh, first. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. I think I like that with the and that to the top of the mouth. I think that adds a little a little something something it, extra it, to it. It kind of brings stuff out. Mm-hmm. I like the onion. I like the the spice. I like. It's just, it's just good. Yeah, Emily, not calling it's anybody. It's not that weird, America. It's pretty good. Yep. Oh, that was hard to swallow. <laughs> like the meat doesn't have much of a flavor. I guess that's what liver is—just flavorless meat. I'm getting that nice lung aftertaste. That's that's settling really well. More oniony version of scrapple. It's like scrapple with chewy rice krispies in it. I think the uh, the scrapple analogy yeah would be would be no, the closest. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. It's more. This is like a hamburger. I, I actually like the spices. It. I don't. I know. still can't pick off what they are. The smell is definitely in a different realm from the taste. Yeah, it's like two separate things. Yeah, I was not expecting to um, to like it at all. I wouldn't not eat it. I would totally eat this all the time. Yeah, I think this is pretty I, good. I, I'm, I'm enjoying this. Compliments to the chef and the sheep. Very delicious. And would you eat this again? Um, can well, put more on the plate. I'll plate's empty. I could eat this every day. I would definitely eat it again. If any of you guys want to send some practice haggises or haggai my way. It would be one of those things I think everyone should try at least once just to try and have that experience. Absolutely. But yes, absolute recommend. Always try new things. It wasn't bad. No. It wasn't good, but it wasn't bad. <laughs> it can't hurt if you want to experience your culture. It's definitely um, top of the chain for food pieces, I think, in uh, terms of Scottish foods. It's, try something new. It's It sounds weirder. When you talk about the constituent parts, yeah. but just like anything else, when it's all together, it tastes good. 
I kept it down, and I, for one, am proud of it. <laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed that. Want to know did. how you? <laughs> Want to know how you guys think about haggis? Um, remember, boys and girls, we do this once a month, first Friday of every month. Thank you for tuning in. Yep. Be sure to check out the Kilts and Culture Group over on Facebook. And this time, I have a question of the day. Okay. I want to know, do you hate Buckle Brogues as much as I hate Buckle Brogues? <laughs> How do you feel about Buckle Brogues? Would you ever wear them? Have you worn them? Or should they be burned? Tell me what you think in the comments. Cool. Until next time. Slanjava. Slanjava. What?